How are we doing? Uh, welcome back to another episode of uh, In Depth. Uh, tonight's a pretty special one, isn't it, Brett? We've, um, it's we, we've very, got, very special. Yeah, we, we've got the, um, it's, it's not nice to say, we've got the ex Leighton Orient manager, Ross Embleton, joining us. So we're going to be picking Ross's brains on on probably some of the questions that he hasn't been asked um, since he's left Orient in how he likes to play football, his, his style, his philosophy, um, and, and the, the bits that that we want to know as managers of what he had to encounter at Orient. So we'll um, we'll see what happens. It's going to be an interesting one. Could be quite a long one. Um, but um, but no, let's get him in and uh, let's get started. Ross, how are you, mate? Thanks for joining us. No, I'm good, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on. Looking no. forward to it, chaps. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Um, we get straight into it. One of the one of the main things I wanted to touch base with you about was because it sort of resonates with me was the the transition from coach assistant into manager because I've had to do it and I found it extremely hard at times. So I just wanted to get from from your point of view, how did you find that step and uh, how many sort of changes to what you do did you have to make? I think um, what was what was different. In my my in my position, or the position that I sort of found myself in to begin with, was I, I didn't want to do it. Mm. I wasn't interested in in it, even though I'd had to go a couple of times at being a, an interim or you know caretaker, whatever you want to phrase it as. Um, it was never really something that I wanted to do. So mm. I was always quite comfortable with taking on the position, knowing that in a minute or when the club or or someone that made a decision about what needed to happen for the for the longer term that I was happy to just hand it over um yeah. and then obviously circumstances changed for numerous different reasons obviously Justin passing away and then um Carl Fletcher coming in after I decided I didn't want to be a manager the first time yeah um and then it sort of become a little bit more reality of um I took it back on interim and then I think everyone at the club decided that there needed to be some definition to the position like was I or wasn't I mm. um so once I did I found it um I found it really strange to begin with I don't know about yourselves but what I've always found really really difficult was the relationships I'd built up with the players so I thought it was quite unique really obviously the circumstances I was doing it in but the fact that a lot of the players that I was working with uh, I'd been with the club for a good period of time, two years or so, um, and I'd built up relationships with them, very, very close relationships because of the loss that we'd all suffered. But then at the yeah. same time, I was the assistant, and you would both know that when you have an assistant or you are the assistant, you can communicate with the it's players. It's a totally different relationship, isn't it? Completely different. And do you know what I found great was... I could tell them the same thing that the manager had told them. Mm. But after it, I could follow it up with, but if I was this, I would do that with you. Or, Let's get out and do this. Let's go and practice that. And then by the end of the conversation, they forgot what you've spoken about. Do you yeah, know what I mean? I forgot that you actually agreed with the decision. And I think I found that great because I could tell them that I agreed with the manager or I backed the manager. Mm. And then I could say, yeah, but do you know what? Let's go and practice your reading or whatever. And, 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 and win them back over that way, I yeah. suppose, if, if you like. Um, and and it become reality that that's obviously not as uh, as easy to do once you're the one putting them in the team or bringing them out of it. Um, yeah. I didn't. I wasn't very. I wasn't very comfortable with it, and I think probably all the way through there was always the difficulties because of some of the players that I had to manage and the relationships I'd had with them. I think a lot of players found it very very difficult that i was then the one that, that was upsetting them every friday yeah, no. so that's what what i found was that the and, and brett sometimes does as well because brett's team they're very tight-knit and they're a group of mates and, and that's the same with me like when i first got the manager job i rallied around my friends to come and help us get out a relegation battle and then it was really hard getting that line of manager and friend so I really struggled for, with that with that fine line between being too close to your players, but still having a good relationship with them. I think it's possible. I do mm. think it's possible. But I think what you need is 
you need maturity from both from both areas from from yourself obviously as the manager and i think that bit becomes probably a bit easier than it is for the players that are involved in that scenario and i think what happens or what i found a lot is that because i was the assistant because i was close to them because i regarded some of them as mates mm. i had listened to them all the way through their time that i'd spent with them so i like you two i love football so when some of them would come to me and say oh when i played for steve evans if he left you out on a saturday he would do this and when i played for lee johnson this is what happened and then i played for this one and that one and i listened to everything because i loved it and i wanted to know yeah, of course. But then what happened was I then went into the job thinking, Do you know what then? I will treat everyone the way that they've told me that they wanted to be treated. And what I soon quite quickly realised is that it don't really matter. If you ain't, <laughs> it, I ain't happy. <laughs> yeah. It makes me laugh when players say, all I want is honesty. Then you give them yeah. honesty and they don't want to hear it. I think, I think that's a football thing though. I think agents, I think players, I think staff, mm -hmm. I think sometimes hierarchies, boards at clubs don't want to hear the truth. And I, I think that is a football problem. I would yeah. still class it as a problem is that take agents, for example, the amount of agents when I first come into it that would say to me, got a player for you. And I go, yeah, I've already got a left back. Yeah, but he's really good. Yeah, but I've already got a left back. Yeah, but can you have him in for a week? No, because I'll have him in for a week. And at the end of the week, I'll still have a left back and he won't have a, I'm yeah. going to have to sit down and say to him, sorry, we've already got a left back. So the best thing to do is not have him in. But really what he wanted me to say was, yeah, let him come in for a week. So it looks like I've, he's done his job. Yeah. And then when I upset him at the end of the week, it's my fault, not the agent's fault. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think... you put all the blame on you, wouldn't you? You put all the blame yeah. on you. I don't, I don't know, know what you're talking about. That's what he was I saying. It, but you really, you don't really want the truth. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. This is exactly that. And that is, it is a very, very tough one. And do you think that's because we're football such an opinion-generated game? that no matter who you're talking to, they're going to have their own opinion on it. And if you don't yeah. sort of agree with their opinion, they sort of bite back at you sometimes, don't they? Yeah, and I, I think I, I think that's why we love it, isn't it? Mm. That's why we love it, is yeah, that exactly. you would pick one team and I would pick something else and we, we'll argue, debate, talk about it all till the cows come home and by the end yeah. of the conversation, I'll still be wrong in your eyes and you'll still be wrong yeah, in my yeah, eyes. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it the, the, the fantastic thing that it is. Um, it just makes it, when you're the one that's making those decisions, it makes it very, very difficult. And I think that's why you have to be, um, you have to be resilient. You have to be able to almost go, do you know what? I don't want nothing to do with anybody else other than the people that are going to matter mm. around my decision making. No, I, I totally agree. And, and, and the, the line that I've used before is to when some players start questioning, I say, well, end of the day, mate, it's, it's me that's going to get the sack. So it's my decisions and I'll live and die by my decisions. So whether you agree with it or whether you don't, it doesn't really matter because you, you'll probably still be here if I got the sack anyway. So, it, it, yeah. and that's what sometimes they don't understand. Yeah. And I think the other thing with that as well is, is that what people really struggle to understand until you're the decision maker. And by the way, this ain't just football, is it? This no. is if you run a business of any kind, if you're the decision maker, you're not going to make a decision based on the fact that you've got your mate that can step in. Don't get me wrong, if you're a multi-multi-millionaire and you can afford to employ your mates, that's yeah. different. But when you're picking a football team, if your career and your life and your welfare and your family, et cetera, whatever circumstances are dependent on those decisions, it's very rare you're going to go, oh, I'll go with this one for any other reason other than thinking it's for the best. Exactly. And one thing I always say is that then I say this to players, I say, well, whatever a decision a manager makes, there's always a reason behind it. Sometimes they don't they don't get they think oh, she's done it for the sake of it. There's always a reason and a conversation before or a process followed to get to that. It's very, very rare that a manager just pick it out of thin air and go, Yeah, that's what I'm going with today. Yeah, and there's also a sleepless night that goes with it. Yeah. There goes a number of phone calls and discussions that have been with everybody else in order to <clears throat> Will come to those decisions sometimes, and I think people think that you just make those decisions flippantly, flick of the coin, like last minute dot com. And when you put on the spot, you're just going to go. There's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of planning and thinking, and 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 like I say, I can whatever else you want to class it as that goes into making. 
the simplest of decisions. And and like I say, until you're the one doing that, making that that decision, it, no one really understands. I don't think. Mm. So the last bit on this subject really is you've had a little taste of management. Is it something you want to do again? We'll get onto this more a bit later yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. on yes and no. I think um, as it like proper. Someone said uh, Graham Alexander was sort of manager when when I was still interim manager at Orient, and it was early in the season, and and um, we had a beer after the game, and he said to me, "It will get you, mate. It will get you. The drug will get you like it gets the rest of us." And I went, "I don't know. I don't know if it will, and I still don't know if it's properly properly got me. Mm. I would like to have another go because I think I'd be better at it now. I'm not at Orient." Now I'm not managing all those, you know, all the things we just talked about. Yeah. But there's not the attachment to the club. There's not the association that goes with it all. The, the emotion of, of of the whole reason why I why I got the job in the first place. I think I'd be better at the job. Yeah. But at the same time, it's not something like burning in me that I've got to go and do it. You know, I, I I've and I think some of that is because of where I've come from and the jobs I've done in the past. I, I look and I think. Ah, oh, yeah. If it was a right youth team job or twenty threes job or you know all the other jobs that might be involved in academies, uh, uh, being an assistant, being a first team coach, those things still appeal to me as much as trying to do it again and see seeing if I if I'd be any good somewhere else. I think the other thing that does grain on me a little bit, if anything, from from leaving it behind, is I don't outright feel like I failed. Yeah, no, you know I, what I mean. I think if we'd got relegated, or we'd lost ten on the spin, or we'd got mangled in a couple of games, then I'd go, yeah, all right, you right. up, you? Go, yeah. yeah all right. But I sort of feel like I've left Leighton Orient where I thought Leighton Orient might be at the moment. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. that that bit sits there a little bit, like a little bit awkward because sort of this type of thing. Yeah, and you sort of think, well, I could have done a little bit more. I, you know, could I do a little bit more about it? But like I say, I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded is probably the easiest way to, to describe it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Russ, what I want to go into is more of the um, sort of on the, on the field stuff. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask was, obviously, going from that number two to being a number one, I'd imagine that from your when you were doing, when you was a number two, you probably had quite a high coaching role within the, uh, within the setup. Now, when you went to be a number one, was you still as hands-on as what you would be in terms of on the training? Is that something you're – like with Darren, for example, he's very much more of a man-manager motivator rather than a coach, whereas myself, obviously nowhere near your standard, but I, I like to be in charge of the training, even little things like warm-ups. I'm very hands-on on that front with a coaching side of things as well. Did you find yourself changing when you went in to be that number one or was it a case of I'm still – doing all that as well i think what you get is and I, by the way what you said there are uh, spot on i think what you've got it, it's all relevant and it wherever you're yeah. coaching or working at any time it's relevant to what you do do you know what i mean and you do it to the best of your ability so i think we're all in the same boat whatever whatever club level you know you, that you're working at. i think what um what i found really awkward to start with when i took the job was everybody felt like they could and wanted to tell me how I should do it. Yeah. And I was a bit like, yeah, but you're all, t at the time, everyone was saying to me, like, you can't feel just in shoes. You're not going to be just in everyone. And I said, no, I know that because we're totally different. Like I coached the way he wanted to do the team to play yeah. because he was the manager and it's my job to do what I'm told with the greatest respect. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. In, 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 in any job, unless you're the, the main man in any walk of life, you have to do what you're told. And he come in and he wanted to play a certain way. And I loved it because I'd never coached a team to be direct, to, to be as intense as we were out of position. So it was great for me. I loved it. But then I went into the job and everyone kept saying to me, you've got to do it like this. So you've got to think about that. So on a Monday, you've got to do, you let, let your staff do it. Like they just had so many different opinions on how I should and shouldn't do it. And in the end, I had to sort of stand back and say, no, actually, what do I want? How do I want it to look? 
Mm. And I think as long as you're true to yourself, and my big part was, yeah, I was hands on a lot. Um, one, because I love it being out there coaching, taking sessions. It's what I've always done. So that's what I wanted to do and what I always want to do. Um, and secondly, it was important for me to then impose what I wanted of the team, especially when I took it on a permanent basis. I'd, as the interim manager, I'd play back three, back four, four, three, 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 five, two, like uh, chops and chatting. The players must have not known if they were coming or going. So when I got the job, it was like, right, this is a system we're going to play. This is how we're going to do it. This is what I expect. So I felt it was my responsibility to deliver it a lot every day. I think then what, what you realise is that it's about picking and choosing your moments. I think that was really as I settled and as we started to look like a, a football team again, that I then started to realise, right, actually, do you know what? I can't do every session. I can't do the match day warm-ups. The, the staff did that. So I had first-team coach or an assistant. They, they, they took that on. Um there were sessions throughout the week where I could say, actually, do you know what? The possessions today, I don't really need to take that. Or small-sided games, not, let someone else take that. And I can just stand back and, and breathe a little bit and have a, have a look and have a watch. And it was then trying to get the balance right of when does my voice get heard and when do the lads get sick of hearing of me? And I think that was really important. It is really important. So, like, analysis. We would do analysis, like, the day before a game, the day after a game. So you can imagine, like... If you had a Saturday, Tuesday week, we're having an analysis meeting on a Monday. We're having one on a Wednesday morning. We're having one on a Friday and then one on a... Do you know what I mean? So you, you're constantly analysing. And so then, therefore, then I then stood back and I really trusted my analyst. And I said to him, no, no, you do, you do the pre-match meetings. You present them. So that then my voice, when I spoke or when I had something to say, it become a bit more... Oh, the manager's talking now, yeah. the head coach or whatever. Yeah. You'll be more think, to a degree behind it because you're not talking all the time. Yeah, because you, you just want to do it all because you like just gave me carte blanche to do as much as I wanted to do with analysis, with coaching. That it was always me. But then he, when he went crash and he made a point or he raised his voice or whatever, it was a little bit like, well, Gaffer's talking. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I was never going to be that, but I needed to then find another way where my voice and my impact was more beneficial to the group than just hearing from me every day. Can I, um, out, well, it is in context to a, to a certain degree, but so obviously it's different at Orient because you're with the players every single day. Yeah. If you was in our situation, so you've only got the boys uh, maximum really two nights a week, Tuesday and a Thursday night, and you're going to see them on a Saturday, you might have two midweek games, so... You might, sorry, you might have one midweek game, so you might only actually have one training session midweek. Yeah. Would you be, would you still have that same emphasis of saying, well, I don't want my voice to be all the time because it's not all the time. Do you know what I mean? Or is it a case where you was at a professional, it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, of course, yeah, you get exactly. tired of the same voice. But I could, from my from my experience, so we, we train once on a Tuesday. If we have a midweek game, we don't even train. So we'll have match day Saturday, match Tuesday and I might not have a training session so I just can't yeah. do it because of facilities and stuff like that now yes. it's slightly different with Darren um, because Darren's got quite big staff as well so he's got an assistant he's got a first team coach with me I've got an assistant I've got a fitness guy who comes and will do the warm up and I'll get him in for example once every couple of weeks to do the fitness or all pre-season and what not yes. um, but it's very much me and the assistant and my assistant is very, very easy in terms of he's quite happy for me to just do as much as I want. And sometimes I, I get well carried away. Like before a game, for example, he might not even get a word in. Um, do you <laughs> but think... that's important, Brett. I think that's important, mate, because ultimately you're the manager and you're putting yeah. that team out there. So, I, I, like, again, I, I'll revert to and talk about my relationship with Just a lot because it worked for us. But... He would always, or 90% of the time, would give me a voice at half-time. Yeah. But there were some times where he never. He'd absolutely yeah. steam into the boys and give them a rocket, and I'd go... Yeah, that's exactly, yeah, that's exactly the same. Yeah. Away. And that's, part, by the way, that's part of your assistant's role. Yeah. Shut up and let the manager talk when the manager wants to talk. Sorry, I cut across you there, mate. But I think, I think don't underestimate, like, that is... 
that he's got that your the people around you have got to be ready to to do what you need them to do. Do you know what I mean? And I think it is how you then make the impact. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I used to I used to listen to some people involved in in non league football, and even when I play, you turn up and, and you'd have a kickabout on a fri- on a Thursday, you play a five aside, and and I'd think like we, we probably could have just had the night off, really turn up and have yeah, a yeah. kickabout. It's about you making an impact, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? In a, in a completely different manner to how, I've, how I said that I would have done it. But for you, with your limited time, if you don't train on a Thursday and you have the boys there on a Saturday and a Saturday, like before the game, right, the fitness guy takes the warm-up, your assistant might do a little bit of a passing drill or, or whatever you do yeah. pre-match. And then it's about you having as much of a say to get all the information across to people that you possibly can in that period of time. And then if someone else gets to throw a, an opinion or whatever in, then great. But ultimately, you're the manager. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's about making that impact on people. What I'll, what I'll add to that, just like, so I've always wanted to get sort of like a professional's output on this. So when you turn up for a, for a match, um, obviously you get there obviously hours before and stuff. Now, I spoke to others, I spoke to Darren about this, but we... What we would do, we would have like a uh, a team talk, if you like, uh, before we do the warm up. So they'll come into the change room. We'll have fifteen minutes, maybe, where we're talking about the opposition, because we obviously don't have the the opportunity to on the Friday night have an analysis and things like that. So we do everything in like a cram, fifteen twenty minutes. We'll go out, we'll do our warm up, and then we'll come in, and then for like fifteen minutes before kick off, ten fifteen minutes. It'll be motivational stuff, going over a few things, set pieces, blah, blah, blah. Would you be exactly the same if you was in our boots or would you be doing stuff slightly different? And what is it like at like a, a professional club? Is it, is it exactly like that or is it more, obviously it's more in depth, but with yeah, time-wise, would you really say that's similar. how it goes? I think very similar. I think what I learned through doing it was... Um, when I first started doing it, I would name the team on the day of the game. I would do a meeting pre-match. So the boys getting up quarter past one, the traffic in late and weren't great. So we just get them in at home game at quarter past one. and We'd have a meeting at half one just to make sure everyone was there type thing. And the meeting at half one used to be like a bit of information on them, some stuff on us, set pieces. And I found I was giving them too much on a match day. Yeah. Uh, then I realised that I was naming the team on a match day and the atmosphere from the ones that were being left out or yeah. the shock one that no one was expecting or, you know, the change that you make because someone needs freshening up, just for an example, made too much of an impact on the group. So, this is very interesting, Ross, because yeah. that's what I, I named you on a Friday night. Right, brilliant. And I, I that's what I started to do. Friday. And I've had so many people say to me, oh, I've not, not seen that before, but it's for that exact reason you've just said. So if I've took someone out or something, I can get that conversation or whatever out of the way before they come to the game. So when they come to the game and they've slept on it, they're sort of over it to a degree. Before, yeah. Because if not, I found when I first started, I named it in the changing room as we got there, at like half one or, or whenever it was. And then you'd see straight away their head goes down. They're starting talking to their mate, going, Coy, you yeah. don't know what you're doing. And it's just that bit of discontent from minute yeah. one. And it's. And by the way, you, you understand that, don't you? Do you know yeah. what I mean? You, you, because, you've been in that position, haven't you? Yeah, whether you've played Sunday morning football your life or you've been a professional footballer, the disappointment of turning up and not being picked is still the same, isn't it? Do you know What's what I mean? It still, again, comes back to that relevance. I think. So then what I. What, what I tried to do was my for I use my Friday as um like our tactical reminders I would call it like it wasn't really ever really 11 v 11 sometimes we would do it like that but it was all us it was how we're gonna press how we're gonna play from the back how we're gonna do this how we're gonna do that uh set pieces etc so nothing out of the ordinary but I found that it was easier to have a few dragging their heels on a Friday in training that, but the next day, the likelihood was that they would turn up and have that, okay, got me head round it type attitude, than, than doing it on a Saturday and them having the raving up. So then what we did was we did our our meeting Friday morning. Uh, we named the team. We went out and trained. Then on the day of the game, boys would arrive 
and I would sh- re-show them the team, the subs, um, and then I would sh- the my goalie coach would show them this is what the other team set pieces look like. Not a lot, like literally. You're talking some days it was like a minute. These that like this guy, this guy's their biggest threat. This is the sort of run that you might make. This is what they do if they play short. Something really, really similar. And then it just kept everything to a minimum. So the whole focus was on, was on, uh, or as much of the focus was on us, but a few little reminders on the day of the game to try to keep it as simple as, as possible. So what, now our three situations completely different because I look at obviously Ross, you're obviously here in the professional game or was in the professional game. Darren's at a higher standard of semi-professional and my team are just starting at semi-professional, although none of my boys get paid. Now, we'll flip the way I I could never name my team on a Friday night in my current situation because the way it would work for me is I'd set the 11 out and then say I've got a squad of 16. Obviously, only three of them are guaranteed to get on and stuff like that. But then all of a sudden, the ones who are not in the squad who might be looking at going, I might not get on. I'm getting a text on Saturday morning saying, should I go work? Should I, you know, is it all right if I go to work today or... Can I go for the resis and whatnot? So, again, in my position, would you still name it on a Friday night or would you, under them circumstances, would you have to do it on the Saturday like I've done it? No, I, I would I would 100% do it. On a, on, when I say 100%, I think there's, there's it's knowing your group and knowing the personnel, yeah. knowing your level. But yeah. that's where, that let's get it right, that's where anybody, and I mean anybody coaching in football, where they get their success from is understanding the level. Yeah. It's understanding that this is what it takes to win games of football at whatever level it is. In the Premier League, at international level, you know, wherever any of us three will are or might end up working, it's about understanding the level and then understanding the group and the players that you've got. Because I yeah. think there's this thing now that goes, and I'm sure we might come on to it later, but when you talk about formations, about players, about what you should expect, how you should, this thing of how you should play, I'm yeah. not really sure if it exists. It's about understanding the group of players that you got and understanding mm-hmm. the level that you're at. And if you are one of the best teams, got one of the best budgets, got the best players at that level, you can afford to, when I say pretty much go out and play how you want, of course not. You've got to have an idea and a structure, but you know there's a certain manner or way that you can go out and play because your players are the better ones in the league. And, and a lot yeah. of the time they're going to win games of football by a moment of brilliance or being a good defensive unit, whatever it might be, um, in order to do it. So I think it's about knowing your level, isn't it? And understanding what's going to help you and what's not going to help you. You know, I, I would, I'd have been the same. When I played for like, Stance did, I was looking 20, 21, like people, if someone had said to me, you ain't playing tomorrow, I'd have gone, yeah, good one, I ain't coming. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It, sure. like, and, and we, you know, most, there'd have been another week where I'd have gone, all right, yeah, I'll turn up and sit around. Do you know what I mean? But... I think it is. It's about understanding your group and the, the the level of football that you're at in order to make sure you get the best things out of it. So because you you want to do things that that the best people do, and I think there is times for it that you can replicate what Pep Pep does with his fullbacks or whatever at any level. But you have to have the right players in order to make it happen. Do you know what I mean? And the, and the circumstances also have that impact as well on on how you behave. Yeah, no, perfect. All right, good. Um, so. Staying in line with what we're sort of going on about. So, <clears throat> Ross, do you have a? I'll leave formation to the to the side for the time being because I think you're going to say what I expect to say with formations because you've said it already when you said about when you first come in you were trying new formations, see what was the best suit stuff like. That. I think that's you know that's obviously common sense and we'll go on to it a little bit in a minute. However, when you're going into a job or let's just say for example, let's just say you took Darren's job tomorrow. Would you, uh, <laughs> would you, uh, would you already in your mind know exactly how you want to play, or would it be still a case of? So you said it earlier. You've got to know you playing your level, isn't it? Knowing your level. So mm. when I first started at Enzyme, we were step seven, which is literally the bottom of the bottom in terms of senior football, if you like. I don't think it's, it's not even senior football. It's top of the it's level right. of grassroots football. Um, yeah. Um, but I was 23 when I took over that job and I went into it so naive in terms of that you still think it's a 
decent standard because you you know some of your mates playing you know they're good players and they one of them was at West Ham one of them dropped out yeah, a couple yeah. of leagues you know you think they're good players and stuff so when I went in there I was very much like I want to play out from the back I want to play over higher press I want the keeper to be able to play and then that first season we we stayed up on the last last day and we come off the pitch every week saying what a great side they are but we were losing um, you know, 90% possession, lose 1-0. And, you know, it was just... And it, t- it was only towards the end of the season where I was like, we're going to get relegated. I'm going to end up losing my job here in my first ever stint. It's going to be embarrassing. I'm just going to do whatever it takes now to to get to get over the line. You know, we signed a few bigger players, a bit more experience, and we just went a little bit more direct. Got a player who knew where the net is, but he weren't easy on the eye sort of thing. Um, and we got over the line. And then the following year, I sort of learned from that still had my principles because I just can't be there's certain things that I just will never do it doesn't matter if I turn up and it's you know the pitch is underwater I'm still not going to be you know bang it bang it bang it bang it just don't sit sit right with me however what I have learned is that I can't do what I want to do even now we've gone up a level and we've got better players than we did I still can't do that even pre-season you know you might play on a 3G and the boys are doing it and you think this is brilliant. We've done this in pre-season like a year ago and then that's, I know in six months' time when we're playing away, I don't know, Stance did, for example, and you're on a hill, it just doesn't happen. So yeah. what's your perspective in terms of going into a new club with obviously your ideas? Do you, do you have a way that you think this is the way I want to start with? If not, obviously you might get there and, for example, they're not as good as you thought or they're better than you thought. Will you adapt or do you just have a case of this is how I want to go and I'll keep things to that baseline. But of course, I'm going to have little different adaptations. I think you have to be true to yourself. The first yeah. thing, like, I think you always have to stay true to yourself. And if you're like you, you said it right there. Like if you, if your principles or your ideas are your preferences are to play out from the back, but your back four or your goalkeeper are crap on the ball. Mm-hmm you're not going to do it. Like, it, 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 it's suicide. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and, and I, I think that I definitely found myself in that situation where I said, right, I, I would love my team to play from the back. And actually, we had a goalkeeper that was the best in the league by no question with his feet. Yeah. But it depended on the centre-halves that I had in the team on the day was to whether or not I wanted them to go and get on the ball on the six-yard box. Do you know what I mean? And then, and then looking at right, the opposition are not going to come too aggressive, or their press ain't great. So yeah, we might be able to play out today. So I think it's about growing it towards something. Do you know what I mean? It's about having an idea of right. If we can play from the back, this is how we might do it. But understanding that we're not always going to set out to do that. Do you know what I mean? And as time evolves, which we all know. Time isn't always the uh, the thing that you get blessed with in this game. But as time evolves and my opportunity to sign a centre-half who can play, that's the one I'm going to sign. So I might yeah. not go and sign the big geezer who wants to edit back down the pitch every time it comes towards him or smash it down the other end of the pitch every time he gets it because that's what he's always been asked to do. You might He might be the best one in the league, by the way, but you might go, actually, do you know what? I'm going to take the lesser defender on this occasion because I really want my team to play a little bit more. Yeah. But then, like you said, the flip side of it is the circumstances that if you go and play at Stansted, I, I wouldn't want to go and get it off the goalkeeper. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> it's about then manipulating your belief. So you might have spent all the pre-season rolling it out off the goalkeeper. You start the first game of the year and you go and play a team that ain't watered their pitch and you go... It's a bit bobbly. It's a bit all over the gaff. So, actually, do you so know we, what we're we, gonna... We've actually turned up to games where they haven't walked with the pitch on purpose in preparation that they know that we've, we've, yeah. we're going to try and play. Like, we've worked all week yeah. thinking we're going to play on a carpet and all of a sudden we turn up and it's bone dry and it's purposely, yeah. you know what I mean? And the perfect preparation for that for us is that we go and play... Stortford in pre-season and they leave their pitch a bit longer one to protect the pitch and two because they probably know that if he's longer and drier on that day it's going to be a little bit harder for him in the ball to play so but that's great that's great because you say to people okay right you know what what we said about when we're pressed and we're going to have to go and play into the art in their opposition's half well this is how we're going to get there 
and this is what we're going to do. So today, this is our option to go and practice it or to go and implement it. And then it's about, right, how do we get control on the game if you want your team to pass the ball? Do you know what I mean? So we're going to kick it. We know we're not going to play out from the back, but when we get here and we can get control on the game, this is how we're going to try to, to build and play. So my preference would be that my team dominates the ball because uh, I think that is, for me, the best way to go and win games of football. That'll always be shot down. But again, it comes down to if you walk into Club A tomorrow and they've got the clientele to go and do that, then you go to do it. If they've got a, a striker that doesn't really want to get the ball to feet, wants to run in behind, then you've got to find a way of getting the ball into those positions to make it most effective in order to give yourself that time and that opportunity to implement a little bit more of what you wanted. So our start, our thing to start the season was, I used to say to my staff, I'd love us to, to dominate the ball from the back, but I don't think we're ready to do it. So we're going to hit it here and we're going to hit it here. And if they don't press us, we'll play to the centre halves. But if they get pressed, we're going to hit it into these areas to get us up the pitch and we'll try and dominate it in the in the opposition's half. Then what started to happen, because we were quite good at that, teams dropped off, let us have it. So then all of a sudden, we could become this team that everyone was going, oh my God, you play it from the back, you dominate the ball, you've got the highest possession stats in the league. And I'd go to the staff, it's actually a bit of a fluke, really, because we didn't set out to do it. We just had a method of the, how we got up the pitch. And then all of a sudden it fell in our lap. Right, okay, we actually can... Teams are going to let us play a little bit more. Teams are going to drop off and give us the, the opportunity to do it. So we're going to have to find another way of of building our attacks. Do you know what I mean? So I think, hopefully I'm answering your question, but I've, I think it's about... The biggest thing about it is your players. And then it's about what they're capable of. And then the circumstances that you're in, if you're going into a club and they've lost 10 on the spin and they're fighting for their lives, it might, you might not have, they might not have enough in their locker at, the, at that time to, to go and get on the ball and really try to, to play. You might have to build it over a series or a period of games. Do you know what I mean? No, that's, that's exactly what I wanted to hear, really, to be fair. Um, yeah. I'll just, I'll, we'll just move on to that sort of formation wise, what you've said. What we said, I know you said earlier that you tried sort of everything. I think it's like us. If you know, if I was to take a job tomorrow, I wouldn't necessarily go in thinking, well, that's the formation I want to play. You need to see what uh, what you've got at your disposal. But on the basis that you had everything at your disposal, Ross, and it was everything you would want in a team, would you have a go-to formation? I'd have three-five-two. I think um, that'd be your favourite one. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I've ever really said it out loud, but to people. But I think I got tortured about the fact that I stuck to 4 3 3 at, at Orient. And the reason was because that was what I felt was our best formation. In order to get all of our best players on the pitch, we played that system. Um, I think for what I like about 4 3 3 is it enables you to get a lot of attacking players on the pitch if you're the team that's got the ball. It allows you to fill the middle of the pitch with players if you haven't got like, you know, the old fashioned two English midfield players, if you like. Um, so I liked it, but I, it wasn't, it wouldn't be my preference. I would much prefer to play a back three because I think you cover the whole pitch. I think you, if you've got, again, a lot of it is down to personnel, but if you've got the right midfield players, you can get control on the game very quickly. And I think certainly at the level that I, I've been working at, but I think it would be the same where you where you are at the moment is if you got two strikers up the top end of the pitch, it makes it a lot easier to keep the game alive. You know when it gets a little bit scrappy and balls go forward, if you've got the pair of them working together closer, it makes it a little bit easier to do those sorts of things. Center halves make or defenders make mistakes. So if you've got two people around those areas of the pitch, balls into the box, it gives you a lot more opportunity to score goals. Um, but a big debate or a big point that I used to make to everybody else when they asked me why I would never change from four three three at the Orient was because you got to be you have the personnel and the right uh, opportunities to to play another system. So if you ain't got a wing back, you can't play you can't play three five two. Do you know what I mean? Can't, and it, it's stupid to just go. In my opinion, sorry, it's stupid to just go. Well, let's just play four four two because that's what we've always done in this country. That's not an answer is it you know what I mean it's you're right it's got to be right by and I think that you know what is really interesting earlier when you it was one of the questions you mentioned but 
I think what we what we find in this country at the lower levels of football is that a lot of people go to watch football and expect it to look how they want it to look. Mm. They don't go there and go like, oh, what players are they? Or what's the manager do? Or what's his style of play? Or what's the opposition like? Are they the better team? Are they not the better team? Like, they go there and they expect to see what they want to see. And that's not, that's not how it works, is it? Do you know what I mean? Because there's other people in charge. And I, like I always say, I liken it to like going to the theatre. You wouldn't turn up and go like, or go to a pop, like a concert and watch Michael Jackson and expect Michael Bublé to be singing. It don't work like that, does it? <laughs> you, 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 the, the game looks how someone set it up to look. Do you know what I mean? And we can't all have it out on our terms. So I think my preference would be to play three five two, but again, it comes down to the personnel and the players. That that goes you? on to what I want to talk about. You, what about you? What about you? See, I I don't I don't know is my my one there because I when the when when we had success at Holbridge in my first full season, we we played four three three, but it really alludes back to what Ross said before: is we had to probably the best players in the league. So we could, and it wasn't very tactical. We didn't really have to tweak too much. It was a case of, right, you got down today. You know your jobs, you know your roles, go and carry it out. Uh, so we didn't really have to tweak and change it for different games. Or, although we did a couple of times. So for, I'm very, very partial to 4 3 3 because I like, I like my wingers. I like, I like having pace and, and real attacking and having a good flow to our attacks. But we also, last year, just before it all stopped, changed to a three at the back. We went three five two, And then we also, with that, we had two tens at points as well. So we had the two tens and then a number nine as a focal point. But that was mainly down to the personnel available at that time. Yeah, We felt we had three very, very good centre-halves and two very athletic, well, at the time they were full-backs, that were getting up and down the pitch anyway. And we wasn't getting enough out of our wingers at the time to justify playing 4 3 3 still. So that's yeah. why we reverted there. And we had two very good players that were very creative and, and scored goals from in the pockets and getting in between the lines. So it all, and I agree exactly what Ross says, it depends what players you've got. Because if, if you're playing, if you haven't really got a left back and you're having to play a left foot centre half, a left back, you ain't going to play him left wing back, are you? And it's like when I see Dan Byrne doing it for Brighton, I'm thinking, I just don't sit right. When you see a big six foot five centre half as a wing back, it, it just I don't know, I just don't I don't get it. So it very much is the the the, the players that really decide that for me. Do you know what I really like? I really, really like the the three at the back wing backs with the with like a you said it there about two tens with like the box in midfield and one striker. I love it. I think it's brilliant because I think you can, it, it, it is so hard to stop. If it, we played it twice this year and I, I, I loved it. I loved it. I loved the way it looks. Again, if you've got the right system and the right players to do it. And I think the other big one in the back three is the type of centre halves you got. I think a lot of people think, hey, you just play three centre halves there. But if you're, if you're allowing your wing backs to go and be your wingers, they, your two centre halves get exposed. So if they're if they're old fashioned edit kick it type centre halves, they're not going to be able to defend in wide areas. So a lot of the time, your right side, left sided centre half actually almost are almost full backs as well. Do you know what I mean? Because of the positions they have to defend. And I I think the the beauty with all formations and different systems that that you that you like and dislike is that they all can look so different, can't they? You know, like you just said there about four three three. If you got three out and out number nines that are direct and pacey and then you ain't playing with wingers do you know what i mean you're whereas whereas you might end up i did we played with with wingers either side sometimes like left lefties coming in right he's coming in sometimes out and out on their right foot so they put crosses it it just looks so it can look so different depends what fullbacks you got in a four three three as to whether they attack or don't do you know what i mean so it's all combination game midfield you have one holder you have the two holders it's, it's interesting you say that about obviously four three three being able to you you it ticks a lot of boxes in terms of you'll have the three centre midfielder so you're allowed to dominate the ball in central areas. You've chances are if you're playing a four three three you've got pace out wide so and you've got that cover going backwards as well. Now I play four three three nine times out of ten. Um, 
if we are chasing a game, last 10, 15 minutes, I'll go 3-4-3 three, three and do what you said with the box and yeah. try and just get as many. The reason why I play 4-3-3 three, three is because, for me, I call them the big hitters. My three big hitters is my centre forward, my right winger and my 10. And yeah. I need two people behind the 10 doing a bit of his work. And I also need to make sure that my right winger is not playing right midfield. So right back's very, very important for me because I don't have, I would love to play 3 5 2, but like you said earlier, at our level, I can't, I don't think there's any wing backs in my league. There's no wing backs. If, if anyone plays three in my league, the wing backs are either full backs or right and left midfielders. They're either good at defending or they're good at going forward. Then nothing in between. And mine would be exactly the same. My right winger, if I played him right wing back, he would leave. If my right back, <laughs> if I played my right back right midfield, he would be in a world of trouble. Just to um, touch on, the reason we changed to it is because we had two weeks without a game. And because I feel, especially at our level, if you're going to go to a free to back, it's, it's not a natural shape for some people. So, right. for example, well, I'd say that the modern day natural shape is 4 2 3 1. Most people know how to play that. Like for our generation, it was 4 4 2. You yeah. knew how to play 4 4 2 without even coaching it. So, we only changed when we had a gap where we could get three or four sessions in to really get into and what we wanted from it. Because I, I always find with, with a free at the back that if you just change it on a spur of a moment, and we did it the year before, we lost 5-0. Because like you were saying, Ross, the, the, the left or right side centre arms are getting pulled into wide areas. They don't know what they're doing. It's not natural for them. They feel they look uncomfortable. So we only changed it when we knew we had a nice enough gap to be able to implement it properly. And that comes back to knowing your level and knowing your group. Mm, exactly that. And knowing your personnel. If you've got a group of players that understand the level, good players at the level can cope, and you you manipulate a formation for one week, to, but they might be able to to do that on the day. Do you know what I mean? In terms of doing that. But it's, there's so much preparation that goes into to teams now that just clicking your fingers and going, oh, do you know what? Let's play four four two this week. That's... I think that's that, that's where the naivety lies in people is that you, if you just think that you can throw a team out on the pitch and and let them crack on that it, that you're going to be able to get consistent results. It might work ad hoc here, there, and here, here and there, yeah. every now and again. But I'm, I'm not sure you consistently get results in anything by just being that flippant. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um. Sorry to pick your brain a little bit, Ross, but I want to. Well, that's what I want to do. I want to pick your brain a bit. So again, I want to use my circumstances now. So, like I said to you at the start, we, when I first started, it was all about keeping the ball, keeping the ball, keeping the ball. Now, as we've developed, we've become, one of the reasons why I like 4 3, three is actually more on a, on a counter-attack, um, in a counter-attack perspective. Now, a problem that we have is that if we've got a lot of the ball, if a team sets up to let us have the ball, we don't do a lot with it. Um, we struggle to, when we get to that final third, so for example, like I said earlier, I call them the three big hitters. They've got loads of pace. They need loads of space to run into. I've got a right, right midfielder, right winger who will play against a left back and I already know before the game he's going to give him a torrid time, but he needs space to work in. My centre forward, 100 metres in 10 seconds, very, very fast, wants the ball in behind all the time. And my number 10, He's very similar to that as well. He's not a typical 10 who wants to get the ball on the half turn and be spraying balls out wide. He wants to get it and actually drive with it. Very, I couldn't... We try and I always say that like, I don't know a number 10 who's like him even in the modern game. He's yeah, just yeah. completely different, you know? Um, so one thing that we've done, especially over the last year, is sacrifice the ball, really. If a, if a team plays possession football against us in our, at our standard in our league, we're going to run right because if they are messing around with a ball at the back and we do count up, like I said to you, we've got three players in the final third who nine times out of ten, they do the damage for, for us. You know, I set up normally before a game and I'll say it's four free and use free when we've got the ball, you do what you want. You know, as long as when we get back, we've got a little bit of shape and you're back left and yeah, right cool. field. But when we've got the ball, they're very fluid. So one will be centre forward, one will pop out to the right and they sort of go wherever they want. Do you think that is a good way to play in them circumstances or would you do something maybe slightly different under 
in them situations. No, I think uh, I I, lo- I love the the thought of counter attack, and I think it's um, I think we where a big big part of our game is going. I think yeah. like especially when you look at the big boys, like most it's like chess now, isn't it? When you watch the Premier League, it's like watching it's like watching a game of chess. Like if someone moves out of position, Man City can just destroy you because they just find the, the space or the or the mm. mistake or whatever, and they they can just kill you with with two, three passes very, very quickly. So I think it is about mastering that. I think that especially further down the level you come, that you can really, really hurt teams with 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 the way that you you counter. I think the biggest challenge that I found out on found on that front was one what what people's expectations were of um, why are you not just having a go at them? Or and sometimes the players yeah. Of like almost a bit like, I can, like what we're gonna sit off and let this lot have it. Yeah. yeah. But actually, it was like no, no, it's gonna it's gonna work in our favour. Like, like I would I love to set my wingers up and go. Do you know what? When we lose it, don't come back here. Just come inside and wait in the spaces. When we win it, we're gonna give it to you and we'll destroy them. We done we done it to Forest Green at the start of the season. They felt everyone in the league said they were the best team with a bottle. And this is funny where where our, our 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 dominance of the ball evolved from was we went away from home and said yeah let them have it and until they get to these positions and then this is where we're going to counter attack them from and I loved it yeah but like you said most a lot of teams not most teams but a lot of teams like the game to be a bit toey and throwy get it forward comes back get it forward so then it's very very difficult to find the opportunities to counter do you know what I mean it's it's those teams that maybe unexpectedly feel like they've got the ball. We we, we played Crawley earlier in the season. We had a man sent off the, after 25 minutes. And I went, right, we'll, pl- we'll, we'll, pl- we'll leave two up, just two wingers, let their two centre, centre halves have it, and un- they will make mistakes because they'll they'll try and force the ball into areas of the pitch that they're not normally used to playing into. And then we'll just counter-attack them between our two wingers. And should have won the game, drew the game nil nil. So I I really like it. The difficulty is where you counter from, isn't it? Like you said, if you turn up and a team starts playing across the back, you think, ah, actually here we go. Then when they when they try and play that forward pass, or they get bored of having it, or they they try one one extra pass that, that they weren't really particularly prepared from, you know, you can go and get after it. Yeah. The difficulty comes when. You're sitting off waiting, and they they hump it forward, and the game becomes. That, a, that's exactly that. Our, that is exactly our problem. I think. What, well, I can only speak for like our. We're, we're obviously one of the better sides in our in our league. Um, I won't say we're the best because we haven't won the league. So even though I'm not even going to go into it, Ross. But um, um, I know the backstory. Don't yeah, worry. We're one of, we're one of the better sides, and to be fair to people in our league, they when they play against us, I. I, I take it, you know, as a compliment when they come up and they, you know, they put a defensive unit, you know, and put 10 men behind the ball. One thing I would say is it does get repetitive with us in terms of, like, we're, we're Darren, Darren would tell you, like, we're very good against the teams who, who play higher. Like, if we play, I know it's only a pre-season friendly or not, but we've probably won more games against Ryman North sides than we've lost. Um, yeah. Just because, it, in my opinion, it suits us. Now, I just feel like our biggest problem was, especially this the year just gone. So the year before, we were top. So going into this season, we were the team to beat, if you like. This year, the first nine games, we played against a lot of teams where they were turning up, home and away, and we were struggling all the time to break it down. And like you just said, it's easy when they want to play out from the back, but nine teams out of ten in our league, they're not playing out from the back. So... Yeah, and, and that's massive, you know, as well, in terms of it's not just about how they play out from the back. Yeah. You know, if they've gone the week before and played against someone else, that they've gone after them and tried to press or tried to, you know, get up the pitch, try to be a little bit more expressive, a little bit more open, then all of a sudden they turn up to play you and you go exactly. like, oh, you've on. Got, at the times of, you go and watch them on a Tuesday night and you come yes, away from yeah. there rubbing your hands and then you turn up yeah. Saturday... And the players that we prepared for, I've done, I've done a team talk. I'll never forget, I've done a team talk about a player. Went on about him for about 25 minutes. Turned up, he was on the bench, where he, he was obviously a bit of a luxury. And I was just yeah. like, boys, just forget everything I've just said. 
It's, yeah. it's, and, it's and don't get me wrong, that still happens. That still happens to us. My analyst will watch four games and come to me and say, right, this is what this is what they're going to do. This is how they try and play. This is what. Then all of a sudden he goes, I'll, I'll get the team sheet, and he goes, oh, they're, that that they're not playing four four two today. You go what? Like, <laughs> so I like that they've, they've got a little tricky winger. He ain't playing. Like what are you talking about? So it happened. That happens at, at every level, and I think again, like you should take it as a as a as a positive. You should take it as a pat on the back. It's hard. It's frustrating. And I, I used to think to myself like. We're tenth in the league. We're tenth yeah. in the league, and this mob have come here today and they're setting up with everyone back behind the ball, not giving yeah. us any space. Then you, then your test starts to come. Do you know what I mean? In terms of how do we break them down? I think the biggest thing that I found for us was that how do we make sure we don't make mistakes? How do we make sure that we don't give them them two or three moments in a game where they can come and nick the goal to to come and fight for their lives to to hang yeah, on see, to. Them? I think our biggest yeah. problem, we're, I've all touched on that, it gets to a stage where I'm, if it's nil-nil, one all, or one-nil up or whatever, where I know for a fact that my boys, they're sort of looking around at each other and they're looking, thinking someone's, someone's got to go and do something here. Like, one of my big hitters has got to go and produce something. Now, I've been lucky enough to, nine times out of ten, one of them might do that. Um, but that's something I wanted to like say to you. Like, what... Would you in game think right? I need to change the formation. I need to. We've all got different players on the bench, for example. So I've yeah. got players that I wouldn't at one or or one nil up. Doesn't matter how bad they're playing. I wouldn't dream of taking off in in circumstances where I need a goal. I'm not taking off my nine who's got thirty goals a season if he's having the worst game ever because yeah. I know at a flip of a switch he might win me the game. I ju I'll just never do that. Um, I've got one or two players who. I've got one or two players that are not even goal scorers. I've got a centre half who I know if he's available, he's always going to play. I've got a centre midfielder if he's available, he's always going to play because he ultimately makes us tick. Um, yeah. But 70 minutes in, we're still not breaking them down. Would you? I, I'm the same. I'm looking around thinking, come on, Lukey, do something for me. Come on, Dom, whatever, whoever it is, do something for me, blah, blah, blah. But in, in that perspective, would you be more of a, inclined to say, right, I now need to sacrifice one of you because I need I don't know I need to take that right winger off you haven't got the space to run into I've got a right winger here who's a little bit more better in between the lines who might be able to create a bit of space or are you I know it's different games you do it in different games one day you might be patient and you regret it one day you rush into it and think oh why did I do that but yeah. would you under them circumstances have something up your sleeve Ross and in terms of saying right the 4-4 four, four, the three five two is not working I'll tell you what I'm going to do I'm going to change the wingers. I'm going to do this. Or is it a case of there is no way of conquering that? If someone's parked the bus, what you know? What do you do? Yeah, I think it's. I think it's sometimes it's what the game needs. Yeah, and it's it, like you, you're standing there watching your game at nil nil, and you're thinking, no, do you know what? We're on top here, and we're going to continue to persevere. You might freshen it up in terms of you know replacing one player with. Like you said, it might be tactical, but it might just be energetic. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Bring someone on with a bit of legs if. You, for what, for the, you know, for what, for, just as one one example, I think a lot of it is circumstances of who you got available, in terms of the type of changes that you're going to make. I think probably from my perspective, I probably could have done that a little bit more of having like a a go to. But I always thought or felt like the big positive is to try to exhaust what you're about first. Yeah. So I, I think people would probably say, I don't know, but people would probably say that I've probably made my subs a bit later than than the, than the norm, 70, 75 minutes. Yeah, but I think sometimes that is probably because I watch the game and I think, no, like we might be 1-0 down here, but we're a better team. Or yeah. you know, it might be 0-0, but yeah, we're in total control here and, and it, it, it will take something and we'll, and we'll get something in a minute. So... I think it's about understanding what the t what the game needs, what your team needs, but then at the same time your circumstances. Because if you look around at your bench and you haven't, you've got a very defensive bench because of injuries or because well, people I'm, are. Put, aware of it. I think I'm it makes it on it on this on this front with Ross. So so at our level of football, I can't have I can't have a bench that's going to be able to replace my best player. That's just not possible. Like no, because. I can't. I put away. I put it, by I the way, I keep him. Do you know what I mean? Only step that's got that, by the way, hasn't it? Yeah. Like, 
Yeah, but I don't even think you're a poor guy now, have they? No, but do you know what I mean? Like, it's, if yeah. Man United have got, you know, Martial playing down the middle and they turn around they've got Cavani, um, yeah. it's not bad. Do you know what I mean? Whereas, no, no, with me, I can only really have, I can only really have a one nine. I'm in a position where our actual second striker is me. I'm our goal. So, it's like if, if I need a goal <laughs> in the last five, 10 minutes, I'm, I'm coming on. That's how desperate we can get at times. But, um, so you got that's what I'm trying to get at the difference yeah. between obviously us and you. Like so what you're in them circumstances. So you're looking at the bench, you know for a fact this guy, I've got a guy on the pitch, he scored thirty goals. I've got a guy here, he's scored three goals, he's wicked in training, and he has got a bit about him, but I, I don't know what he's gonna I don't know what I'm gonna get from him from week to week. Like sometimes he plays, sometimes he ain't. Do you that's that's sort of what I'm trying to get at with you. Like, is it more gonna be a case of we're not breaking them down. I need to change the system. What would be sort of your go-to? So four-three-three, for example, was me. Yeah, I'm playing. I can't break them down. It ain't happening. I'm 75 minutes. I've got no options on the bench in terms of I can't change that front three uh, personnel-wise. What what would you do, Russ? Would you be inclined to say what's another formation do you think would work? What might open up some gaps or flood some areas? You know what I mean? Yeah, I do, and I, th- I think I think like like you said there, you play with a ten, and he's important to you. So you want to keep him on the pitch as much as you can. I think you know what sometimes happens. I think you this might not answer your question outright. So if it don't, tell me. But I think when you go like some two people go, right, I would play a back three because it means we're taking a defender one less defender off. Yeah, and we're, and we're moving him into another area of pitch. But actually, sometimes you're wasting have him free at the back because the other team are only leaving one up. Do you know what I yeah. mean? So you might be better off with a back four, but you just push your wing backs on. I think it's, I think that's the big thing for that. I would say that I've started to take away in terms of reviewing what I did or didn't do is, is about for me, how you manipulate what you expect sometimes from your shape. I think yeah. like, yeah. I think now more than ever because of what Pep's doing at Man City and what, what Klopp did at Liverpool last season, his fullbacks are so important to to, yeah. to to the modern day game. So, like, we were very, we were actually quite, I would say, negative might be the way of putting it with our fullbacks. They weren't always overlapping, getting crosses in in the final third. So, when we were struggling to break teams down, it then started to be actually right. Uh, funny enough, I was playing a, a centre half at right back b- due to injuries and stuff. So it was like, well, I'm not going to ask him to go in the final third. Stupid. Like, let's keep yeah. him back, and we'll, we'll be almost like a back three at times. But I know the left back, he's a converted winger. He can attack. He'll get forward. He'll get over. So I think then all of a sudden, it's not necessarily that we then change to a back three. But when you're chasing the game, you're one nil down, or it's nil nil, and you're trying to win it. You ask your, you, 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 you know your wing back is right. Okay, now you're going to go and be a little bit more positive. Do you know what I mean? You might go from having, still having three in midfield, but instead of the two and a 10, you might have someone playing next to the 10 and just having one deep. Do you know what I mean? So you start taking a few more risks. Yeah. It's funny, you, know, it's funny you say that because in our league, and I can't, I don't know about you, Darren, but in our league, mm-hmm. so my fullbacks are going to hate me for saying this, but every week, if I go and watch a game on a Tuesday night, I already know on Saturday, first thing I want to be saying to the boys is their fullbacks are terrible. The fullbacks in our league are always the weak link. I couldn't name in our league, when I look at, down the league, all the fullbacks, every single team, they're the weakest players. A hundred, hundred percent. My team, you know, it's hard for me to say that. When I, I say it in the team in the team talk all the time, my fullbacks are looking at each other like, oh yeah, cheers, Gaffer, well done. Um, <laughs> I'm buzzing for today. Um, so, for example, when you said about taking one off in terms of, I, if I'm chasing a game, I'll go three at the back. I won't take a centre half off, but I'll take off a right back or a left back because my right and left backs do not score. And I mean, when I say don't get one a season, I mean do not get one a season. And they don't get assists. They're not up and down. I want them to be, but they're. Yeah. I think at our level, you're either a defender or you're an attacker, and there just ain't no in between with, with the fullbacks at our level. It's slightly different because obviously I know players at Darren's level. If I have a right back who can go forward and go back, he's getting snapped up two leagues above and earning hundred quid a week or whatever, no problems at all. And I've got good right back and a good left back, but they're good at defending. 
and they're not going to yeah. go away. So I'll take them off and I might bring in a centre midfielder who I'll put in the middle of the back three and I'm going direct now, who I know has got better distribution than the other two centre arse. And when he's got the ball, he's just going bang, 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 hitting the areas where the two wingers can go or put a, sometimes at our level, I don't know, yeah. it's definitely probably not Orient, but I'll put a centre full, I'll put a centre back up front for the last 10 minutes if I'm desperate. Yeah, no, 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 I've done it. I've done it. And I think, because if you're going to bang it forward, you need someone who's going to edit. Yeah, <laughs> Which is great exactly. respect. Like, we didn't have no strikers that could, that could or wanted to edit. So that was what that was what we would do in the last five, ten minutes of games. I think, like, it just as another example, I had a young boy coming through the academy who I really, really rate highly. But he had a lot of injuries in season, very stop start. In my last game, we were chasing it. I played him in the middle of the back three. He's a, he's a, he's a midfield player. I made him, played him in the middle of the back three. And I said to him, when you get it, just drive into midfield. Just drive into midfield all the time. Just leave the other two there defending it. They, they, they'll deal with it. You keep stepping in. And then when you step in, stay in there and be an extra midfielder. So now the other team are going, whoa, hold on a minute. You're playing, you're playing this piece of deep. And Bars, doing? Bars are doing that with De Jong at the moment. Yeah. I don't know if you know that, but yeah. Bars yeah, are yeah, like, Matt, like it's proper. Do you know what I mean? It's proper. Not, but I knew he was capable of doing it and it, it, and it was brilliant. So what I suppose the point I'm making is it's, it's just another way of doing it, isn't it? It's another, yeah. I'm playing a back three, but actually when we got the ball, like it could be anything because he's in, he's, he's in the middle of the pitch. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, with that, what you were saying before, I think sometimes them slight tweaks make more of an impact than a wholesale change because and at our level a lot, say for example, we was playing 4 3 3 and all of a sudden we take off uh well, take off a full back and put them out under another striker on to go three four three, then the other team's gonna make a change to counteract that. And which means they'll probably put another player behind the ball. So you're just compacting that space even more. Mm. Whereas if you just change, for example, your your combination in midfield to have one holder and two tens then you're getting more players forward, but it's a bit more of a, a slight tweak. So the big psychological change isn't there for the other team to cotton on to. Because that's what we do a lot. And we, we do similar with, with what you were saying, Ross, about your fullback. We've got a right back who can go and play right wing if you want him to. So would you say to him, stay higher? Just get him to push a bit higher and, and so on. And the same in midfield, we've got a, a combination there that we can, we can swap and change to how we want it to be, whether it's two holders and one further forward. And we would go on that sort of promise where we just tweak what we've got rather than making a wholesale change. Because mm -hmm. I feel every time we've made a wholesale change, it's, I'd say nine times out of ten, it's not really worked because the other team have gone, all right, you've done that, bang, we're going to go to a five at the back now and just compact it that way. Yeah, and, and, and what, I, what I love so much about it is it's about getting the best out of, of what's there at the time. So you just said there about the right winger, the right back becoming a right winger. Like, if you're left back, with the greatest respect, if he's a defender or if he's 37 and ain't got the legs to run up and that, why are you going to ask him to do it? Do you know yeah. what I mean? So you're going to get your team to get the best result that you possibly can. And that's that, that you might say, oh, I want to see my wing backs, my full backs, my wingers do this and cut inside and well if they can't cut inside they're, they're an old-fashioned winger who goes around the outside and gets crosses in let the geezer go and do what he does best you know what i mean i think that's that's the that's the ideal isn't it is to try and get the very best out of the individuals in whatever position that they are and you manipulate as you go in order to try to to meet the needs of what the game is at the time is that no, and i think i think that leads perfectly onto the next topic really which was the the recruitment side of things when you as at Orient. So I'm massive on recruitment. So like Brett says, um, until this year, I haven't really got that busy on the training pitch. I've sort of got people in my staff that will take care of the, the sessions and coaching. I take sort of a back step and, and oversee it. But I'm huge on recruitment, whether that's personnel or staff or players, whatever it is, I feel, especially at our level, the recruitment is huge because, like I said, we don't get a session a day to improve the players. We get very limited time with them. So we have to be very shrewd with, with getting the right tools for us to go and do what we want. So that leads on to, to how involved was you in that side of it? Because I know you say you're a coach, first and foremost. Was that new? Was it challenging to step into that recruitment side and, uh, and get involved? And, and clearly you sort of knew the type of player you wanted. Was it possible to go and get them? So I know I think it was the, the January you had quite a busy window, didn't you? Yeah. 
and you're rightly bringing a few in. So yeah, I just wanted to touch base on that really and see what what your thoughts are on it. Were it's tiring, really tiring. But I felt like even though my title was head coach, I still felt like. And I think you would, it would be the same for any manager that recruitment is key. If you don't get your, if you don't get your recruitment right, you it don't matter sometimes how good a coach, manager, organizer you are, you you're up against it. If you don't get the right ones, I think the the big thing, biggest thing that I learned is that you have these ideals, and you before I just felt like yeah, you go and get what you want, but actually it's about identifying for, for us what we did was our process was imagine the window shuts tomorrow mm -hmm. let everyone have a breather for for five days and then the monday after it shut we would sit down and go right okay what do we need what's our priority for january um yeah. right we want a left back and a left left winger for example right who's the best ones in the league identify the best ones in the league right can we get them can we afford them right no okay get them off the list because as much as we'd like to have them we can't afford them so now we have to then prioritize right okay who's in the league above that's only played a certain amount of minutes that was a big thing that we really did so we we went through the analysts went through loads and loads of, of players and said right he's played if they've played under 300 minutes for example this season why and can we access them? Can we afford them again? And then it was a case of, right, this is culminating like a bit of a list of like between eight and 10. And then again, off the eight or 10 that we had there, we had, we'd profiled every position in our, in our team. I'm more than happy to show you one day if you want to have a look at it, but yeah. we profiled every position in our, in our team and said, right, what, what would we want from our goalie? Now, I'm not going to sit there and say you want Edison. But what do we want from our goalie? Right, so we want him to be able to play from with his feet. Yeah, okay. So we need a goalie that can pass it. So let's make sure that we don't just go and get one that's 35 and spent most of his career kicking it up the other end of the pitch because he might be the best goalie in the league, but he might not fit for us, just as an example. Um, and then we, and we scaled down the list like that so that we came to a point where there was a list of five and then we really prioritised in each position because I think that was important. So we identified start the window, we might need a left back and a left winger, but we needed to make sure, certainly at our level, and it'd be the same for you, that there's, it, there's every chance if someone does really well in the first bit of the season that someone comes and has him. So yeah. you've got to be ready that, yeah, we've got a right back, but he might go in January. So we need to make sure there's a list of five right backs. Um making sure to find out who their agents are, talking to their agents, making sure they're the right characters. Um, we put together a presentation on the position that we wanted, how we yeah. play, what we expect of those players, and then how that player would fit in to that position and that in our system. Um, and then the next part of that was I would have a phone, I had a phone call with the agent, phone call with a player, and then I'd have a, I had a Zoom call with the player, showed him the videos and what we expected of him. And then we would get, we got clips of him playing in his position, saying that this is what we we see you doing. This is where yeah. we feel you would you would sit and what I expect of you. So by the end of that meeting, um, they would I would say to him, right, you, like, go away, give it a couple of days, have a think about what you want to do. Is there any questions on? what you expect of us because by then they can walk away and they know everything. They know everything about the way that we play and everything that I expect of them when they walk in the door. And if they want to go and sign for someone else for more money, then so be it. Yeah. And, I, and I also said to him, by the way, if you want to go and sign for someone else in the league and you've got all my secrets, I just got to get better. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it was, it was, they knew everything about me, about the club, about what they expected. And then it was down to them to make the decision as to whether or not Leighton Orient was the right club for them. But it was incredibly time consuming, incredibly time consuming. Um, but what we did always feel was that when we got to that list of three or five that we were going for, that we definitely knew that if we didn't get the best one or the one that we wanted, that number two, three, four and five were capable of also coming in and being able to perform even if it wasn't the best one that we wanted you know 
So with, on, on that, you said that you did work out if you could afford them. Would that be through conversations with agents and stuff like that that you'd have before you even start looking at them properly to see whether they were worthwhile looking into? Yeah, especially if they were like a big dog in the league. Do you know what I mean? If they were like, if they were at Salford, you probably just straight yeah. away went, no, I ain't getting them. Um, <laughs> if, uh, then sometimes if they were at a League One club and you sort of thought, we might not be far off of this mob with, with, our, with our budget and what we can push to, then, then you'd look into it in a little bit more depth. But agents was always really the the priority. I was always very much of the opinion of just going through the front door. I don't know how, how, um, how right or wrong people perceive it as being, but we, I just went, well, could, has anyone got the manager's number? Like, he, he, he ain't played for it. He ain't, he's, he's played 200 minutes for him this season. It ain't because of injury. I'll just phone him up and see if you if if they want to do a loan deal for him or yeah. or if we can start to do something like that. Like I don't know if it's the right thing to do or the the right or wrong way of doing it, but it, what's the worst thing to say? No, he ain't available, and <laughs> we move on to the next player. Do you know what I mean? At least you know straight away you go to the next on your list. Yeah, and and by the way, as well by doing that with a manager, he knows I ain't having a conversation with one of his players behind his back. Hmm. No, it is very, very true. And and how how different was the process to what you may have perceived it to be before you went in as manager? Or was you right involved in it all when you were assistant coaching? No, I wasn't at all. The gaffer and, 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 and Martin Ling did all of that. And it was only if I knew one of the lads or if I'd worked with one of them before that I would get involved in it. Um, it was extremely different. I, like Because I am the way I am, I, I, I try to be... I try to be. I, I, I've just become accessible to people. If an agent phones me, I phone them back. If they text me, I text them back. But I realise now why some managers just completely ignore agents. Do you know what I mean? Because everyone's got a better player than the ones you've already got. Um, some people are using you as a bargaining tool, so you feel like you, you, you're progressing somewhere. And then all of a sudden, from under your feet, they they sign a new deal at the club they're at or they go somewhere else and you think, really? Like, we, we were working towards something here. Like, don't get me wrong, not every deal comes off, but I think that was the, that was the biggest thing that I found is that constant phone calls. I, ge- genuinely, when the window shut this January, the week after, you know, you get the screen time thing on your phone. Mm. I was sitting in the office and I, it come up on my phone and I opened it and it said your screen time is down eighty seven percent this week. <laughs> <laughs> that leads me on to, to, to the last week. What obviously we don't have a deadline day. We can sign players right near enough of the whole way. We used to have a, a date right towards the end of the season when they say right, no more registrations. Right, yeah. Deadline day actually like when you're in the thick of it. Is it as carnage as what it's made out to be? Um it can be. I think it can be dependent on your circumstances and, and what happens. So, um, like, don't get me wrong, I ain't pulled up and with my arm out the window like Harry used to. I ain't, <laughs> I ain't ever got to that level where someone's waiting to talk to me at the great the training ground. But um, it can be. I think the big thing for us was we tr- because of all the work we'd put in, as soon as the window opened, we felt like we were, like, foot to the floor in terms of trying to start the process early because the, the the January transfer window is 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 balmy because you're fitting it all into a month so you think to yourself there's no point in waiting sometimes you can wait till the back end of the month and get a few bargains do you know what I mean but for me what's you got four weeks so sign the geezer at the beginning of the window and then you got three extra weeks that you've worked with him for used him, played him in your team. So we tried to get things done as early as possible. I think where the worry comes at our level is the outgoings. You are constantly holding your breath all the way through. And then because of the carnage that you're talking about, anything can happen at any moment. If someone drops down injured, if someone gets a move, you know, like the food chain, someone goes and then all of a sudden you see it go, and then all of a sudden five or six moves happen because of money and, 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 and people's priorities. That was the biggest thing for, 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 for me that I found like the carnage bit was holding my breath to see who was 
who or if anyone was going to go. And last January, we, um, I, I drove home and it was deadline day was Friday. Mm. And we had a game the next day. And now at the time, we were six points ahead of Stevenage, who were in the bottom two. There was other teams in between us, but we were six points. So we had them the next day. And I was driving home, and my, my old man was at my house, and I said to him, oh, Dad, I'm going to pick up a bottle of wine because deadline day is over. And no one is going anywhere, right? I had the bottle of wine in my hand coming out of the shop, and my phone rung. And I looked down, and it was an agent, and I went, oh, no. <laughs> We've got two hours left. We've got Stevenage tomorrow. And I answered it, and he went, oh, like, I won't say the player's name. That's not fair. But like, so-and-so, I've come in for, for this player. And I went, right. I said, the, the window shuts in two hours. And he went, yeah, I know, but they've come forward now, like things have changed and they want to do something with him. And I went, ah, oh, you're having a laugh. Like, we we got quite a big game tomorrow. Like, what am I, am I, like one, he's going to go. How am I going to replace him? I've got two hours. Yeah. And I just held, I went home, still drunk the bottle of wine, a lot quicker than I thought I was going to. But uh, I sat indoors waiting to see if the board were going to take the bait of letting him go because he, he would have gone on a free at the end of the season. Unfortunately, they stood strong and said, no, no, like we'll let him go for nothing. The rewards of letting him go now are not going to be beneficial enough to to let him go. So that, for me, is where the carnage is, is really can really be felt, because you just don't know who's who's going to be staying and who's going to be going right until the actual, until it's slammed shut. And the last bit, really, on the, on the transfer is obviously the summer one. You've, you've probably got, you've got a lot more time and then the season hasn't started yet, so you're still still in the process of building your squad and what you're going to do. But with the January one, is there a bit of panic in thinking we've only got a short period of time here? We need this, this, and this. And do you? Do I'm not saying you did or you might have, but do you think it's why sometimes the January moves don't really work for players because they are sort of not the first choice, but brought in because the manager or the or the club feel. We need something in this area. Yeah, I think there's two angles to that. I think the first one would be is if you're a manager and you've gone into a club in October, for argument's sake, obviously it's a pre, it's a, it's another man's players. So mm. I think that makes it very, very difficult. And you probably get to January and think, I'd really like to freshen the group up. I'd really like to bring in one or two of my own faces. So you do. So that's that's where that becomes like a bit of a forced priority, if you like, because you want to get new blood into into that environment. I think the other side that you get where a lot of them don't work is that a lot of the reason you get a player in January is because he ain't been playing. I, I don't. There's not many you sign, and he's been playing every week for someone. So I think that then becomes very very hard. And we had it, we had it a little bit this time around, but last time. Uh, last January, we had it where we signed a lad from Gillingham and he hadn't played all season. So I brought him on for half an hour. Then I brought him on for half an hour again. Then I started him, brought him off for an hour. And when I brought him off, all the crowd were going, oh. But no, if I believe him on for any longer than an hour, he's going to get injured. Yeah. So then I had to play him again for like 60, 70 minutes, whatever. Then, then he was ready to play 90 minutes. But I had to wait three weeks to get him there. Do you know what I mean? So... It's very, very difficult to integrate them players into into the group if they haven't been playing football. So um, that that's why I think some of them don't work as well is because players are are trying to catch up and it and it makes it very difficult in the middle of the season. Yeah, no, no, I get that massively. So that, that's it on that side. And then now I'm going to over to Brett because the England team is mm -hmm. one of the biggest topics. And uh, yeah, go on, Brett. Well, yeah, I'm just going to continue on sort of what I've touched up on and in terms of picking your brains a little bit in terms of formations and your proceed, you know, your the way you would select things. So, I, you know, I'm sure you're on Twitter as well, Russ. Like, Twitter for me every week is so... I've got to be honest, Brett, before you carry on, I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. It's like my biggest bugbear. I hate it. I just don't... I don't get it. I don't. I don't understand it. And I know that when we lose a game, I get my. I absolutely get tortured. So I don't touch it with a barge bowl. There's a. There's a. There's a Twitter handle of my name on there because when we lost Justin Edinburgh, I thought it was the right thing to do to 
to tweet. Do you know what I mean? But other than that, I don't, I've never looked at it again. So, but well, I, but keep it, you know, it's mate, absolutely that's a bit of horrific. Fun. Keep it that way because yeah. it's absolutely horrific. And if I could yeah. come off it, I would. But I'm absolutely addicted. So I think, um, I think you know what I think the big thing is, though, mate. I think Joey, I, I'm not diverting away from you from what you wanted to talk about. But I think what I've found with it is it is. It's a brilliant thing to have. Do you know what I mean? I have had it in the past. Don't get me wrong. And I think by me not being on it, I miss out on a lot of great things. Do you know what I mean? Coaching information. I think you can type something in Twitter search and find it like that, can't you? However unique it is, you can find it. So don't get me wrong. It's fantastic if you can stay away from me, if you you can stay away from the from the nonsense. I just I struggle with the fact that I have someone criticising me on a Saturday night after a defeat, and then when you click on his profile, it's a picture of his cat. Oh, mate. <laughs> mate. Don't, even, don't even go there. Don't even go there. I actually I sent a troll my address on Sunday when I completely lost my shit. So <laughs> I'm the world's worse. Um, <laughs> I think I, I think it can be the undoing of some people. I think that's the, that's the difficulty, do you know what I mean? I know a few managers that were very, very active on it, um, like well before they were managers or when they were number twos or coaches or whatever and then when they step into it you then realize whoa hang on a minute like people can be scathing people can be Mm. and then all all of a sudden you sort of half put yourself on a pedestal and on a platform and you're easily there to be shot at aren't you about about being accessible to 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 if you put yourself on there you're accessible to every single fan exactly right you're not sunday morning sunday morning i Look, Saturday night, I had a, I had a, I had a bad night on Twitter on Saturday I, night. I had to text him and see what he wanted my sat nav to find his head. His head Mate, was on gone. Saturday, Saturday night, I had a bad night on Twitter. And I woke up Sunday with a bit of regret. And uh, yeah. well, I, anyway, I, I, reti- I retired you, from I, Twitter. I with my brother and everyone that like I don't, I genuinely don't care what people say on there. I don't yeah. want to know. Don't tell me. Don't answer them. Like that, but I can see it. Don't get me wrong. I can see why people. It's, it's bad, mate. Thing. Sunday morning, I tweeted, uh, "That's enough Twitter from me. I'll, I'll see you all pre-season." And I literally five minutes later, someone put something up about Man City. It was, and no one can stop Guardiola. And I snapped and straight away put up Man United beat them two 0 last week. And then I was like, "Well, I had about twenty texts, and that lasted long." I was just like, "Oh my god!" I think I've tweeted about seventeen times today. So. <laughs> Um, right, so what I want to do, Russ, anyway, what we're going to try and do with every guest that we get on leading into the Euros. Now, again, I've been rowing on Twitter with everyone about who should be in the England squad. More importantly, who should be in the England team. So what I want to get from you, I don't want to get a 23-man squad. I want to get a start. I don't know if I know 23 Premier League players <laughs> anymore. I've um, been watching Mansfield Paul Bell for the last three years. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get a start in 11 and then a couple of questions regarding would you, wouldn't you take? Um, and that's it. That's all I want. Oh, what you said about England, I thought you might ask this. Struggling already. So we're going to go goalkeeper <laughs> to start with. Who, 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 Who's your number one? Cool. I... Oh. Do you know what? I don't... I don't mind the boy at I don't mind the boy at Man United, you know. Get in there. I don't mind it. I think do you know what I love about him though? Is the way he's gone about it. I think like the loans, he's I think he just comes across like he's proper backed himself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't, very, like, very confident. These, very, very confident. Some of these players that come up in in the next little while, I, I won't won't for a minute say that I know him inside out because I, I genuinely have only just started watching Premier League football again. But with someone like with a kid like him, the fact that he's gone, yeah, I'm coming back to Man United and I'm going to have a right go with the hair, tells you something about him, doesn't it? Who do you support, Russ? Orient makes it even harder. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's right. We're not going to get no... get, none of them are get players getting in the England we're team. Get, no, we're not going to get no biasness, so that's good. So we're going Hendo goalkeeper, yeah, yeah. Oh, now no, this, no. this, 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 this is going to cause an argument. Right, right back. I was hoping you were going to come to this one last. There's two positions in the England team I'm struggling with. How good are our right backs at the moment, by the way? Yeah, Very hello. good. And the best one ain't in the squad. So uh, that was do you know what? I was just gonna say 
that like you've got Reese Jones, Carl Walker, you've got all do you know what? I think the kid at Southampton, he's a really good player as well. That yeah. like, um Carl Walker Peters. I quite like him among others. I, I actually personally would have Trent. Disappointing. <laughs> Friends. See, for me, when it comes Dale, to... Right, I'm sorry, Dale, who have you got in goal? Me, in goal, Henderson. As long as he keeps playing for United, Henderson. And right back for you? For me, I would go... See, for me, it's Trent or Wan-Bissaka, and it depends who we play against, whether I want an attacking fullback or a defensive one. If we play for his... Hazard, left wing, I ain't having Trent out there because he do not know what that a week it is. So yeah. I'll go Trent because we, we're going to win the Euro, so we're going to be on the front foot. I'll go Trent. Oh, hold on. First, what formation are we playing, Ross? Oh, you're going to say that. Jesus. <laughs> I'll go 4 3 3, I reckon. Because we've all You know what I'm struggling with because I know in a minute you're going to ask me about left siders and I've got a complete mind blank on left siders. But I think I would go. Free. Yeah, we've just picked a right back, and I. <laughs> um, I'm going to go. I'm going to go four three three. So we're going two centre halves. The theme of the night: three five two. Three five two, yeah. Yeah. He's, so is Trent your right wing back? I go right wing back, Trent. I've gone with him now. I got can't change it, can I? I okay. So our three centre halves are John Stones, one hundred percent. Yep. We're now all in I'm agreement. Scrambling. Now I'm scrambling. Um... Are you? Are you scrambling already? Because <laughs> there's someone here who's hundred percent got to be in, isn't he? From a United fan. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm trying to think of the other side. I'm just trying to think. So, yeah, I'd go Maguire, but I can't think who I'd go with with the other one. Um, Between two for the other one. I'd either go Cody in the middle because he plays it a lot and he's very good at it. Or I'd go Mings on the left-hand side for a bit of balance with his left foot. I well, love I Mings. I love if Mings I was, defender. If I was to play three centre-halves, my third one would be Godfrey. Do you know what, though? I watched Man City. I'm trying to think who it was against a couple of weeks ago. And John Stones almost played as like a right-sided centre-half. It was more of a back four by the end of the game. Cody ain't a bad shout, you know. No, I've got that. Scouser, though, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> No, that's my back three. I'm going to go Cody in the middle and John Stones on the right. Thank you, no. Left wing back. Now, this is... See, I'm going to throw a curveball with my left wing back. Well, there is only one. There's only one left back who deserves to be in the, in the, in the squad at the moment. The left back. Left wing back. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Well, he's, he's back, just as good going forward as he is going back now. So, I'm not biased at all either, Ross. So you're going Luke Shaw? I'm going Luke Shaw all, all, all day long. That's a good one. Go on, who's you going with, Dale? Saka from Arsenal. Mm. He's good. I like him. Because he, 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 I think he's brilliant. Yeah, he, he's good. I, don't, I think he's 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 good. Now, but Luke Shaw, back, yeah, Luke no, Shaw's I'm the best left back in the country at the moment. I'm isn't going he? Shaw. Do you know who else I really like who gets forgotten about? And I'm, by the way, I'm not saying put him in the squad, but I really like him and I think he's just completely gone under the radar for years. He's Bertrand. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. I, I like that. that Justin as well before he got injured at Leicester. Yeah, good player, isn't he? I like him. So are we going two holding midfielders? No, I'm going one. Only because I need to get some of the tens in, and I don't know which one I'm going to put in yet. Is the one? Who's the one? Because this is hard now. Then, if that's if that's what you're doing. For me, yeah, mine's now on. So, Dow, you're Henderson, aren't you? Yeah, massively, all day long, and I'd make him captain as well. No, can I change my shape? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yep. <laughs> Here he is. Can I, go, can I go with a box in midfield? Yep. So you're going to go... I'm going to go Declan Rice. Yep. And Mount. Yep. And then the two tens, I'm going to have Grealish and Foden. Yeah, I'd, okay, if we're doing that shape, I'll do the same, but I'll have Henderson instead of Rice. Yeah. Henderson's a great shout. He's so close, isn't it? And he is yeah. a captain. He is a captain. He's a great shout. So, but... Fucking hell. Good side, isn't it? Yeah, well, it is, but with some big, big hitters missing. So you've got one player left, and I'm assuming it's going to be Harry Kane. Yeah, so yeah, you know what? My three-five-two is going to be Calvert Lewin and Harry Kane. This is bold. <laughs> I'm going Harry Kane. They've left out Sterling, Sancho. Oh, that's why it's killing me. That's why it's why it's killing me. <laughs> How many good players have we got? Sub being Gareth Southgate. Oh no, he. But he'll still play four old midfielders and five at the back, so yeah. don't worry. So I'm assuming then. It, so this will just move on. So you're three five two, three four three then. Box, we'll call it. Yeah. Hendo, Trent, Stones, Maguire, Cody, Shaw, Rice, Mount, Grealish, Foden, Kane. Yeah. Well, I do like it, to be fair. Hmm. But the Sterling one's killing me. <laughs> yeah, that'd kill me at all. Mine would be, my front three would be Grealish. Kane, Sterling with Foden, like in a 10, 8, 10. Uh, yeah, the only other one, the only thing, I think the real big one that I would throw out it would be, be whether or not you went with Grealish or Sterling. <sighs> so, you know, so, what me a little while ago was someone, I went to work and someone said to me, Grealish or Foden? And I went, oh, Grealish, but I'd love to watch loads of Villa. Cause, fuck cause Foden is. Whew. Oh my God. But I'd, <laughs> I'd watch loads of Villa because I know Dean Smith and I thought, no, nah, Grealish is he, he, he's ridiculous. He's unbelievable. And then for the next couple of weeks, because he'd said it to me, I just watched loads of Foden and, no, nah, it's embarrassing. He's unbelievable. But Sterling, Sterling, <laughs> where'd you put him? Uh, mate, so, and that's what you've got. Dow, just Dow, you're, you're 4 three, three, yeah? If I, if I was picking this in there before 3 three, yeah. Yeah, so it's the, it's the World Cup final tomorrow. You're going Hendo in goal. Yeah. World Cup final, you're going Trent or Wan Bissaka. Who are we playing in the final? France. Playing uh, France, Wan Bissaka all day long. Yeah. Two and Trent, Mbappe, no chance. Two centre halves. Uh, Stones and Maguire. Yeah. Left. Luke Shaw. Then you're going Rice and. Oh no 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 no! I'm not. I don't. Oh, really so, right. no, you're going Hendo and Mount, yeah. Go you know, Mount Foden, my midfield three. Greenish, Kane, Sterling. Yeah, see, yes, that's good. He's 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 doing this because we've not picked Rashford. Yeah, I, Only... I, 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 I do like Rashford a lot, but I, I wouldn't go. The Sterling one's the one that's destroyed me. Well, I tell you, I tell you my problem, and I've said that me and you had a row with this over this, didn't we, Dan? So it's been yeah, nice to see your um, improvisation on this, Ross. My problem is, I can't see a front three, and I'm going on a basis that he's going to play a front three, with Sterling, Grealish and Kane, because I don't think there's enough in behind. I think that Sterling and, even though Sterling's quick, I don't think he, I think Sterling, Kane and Grealish all want to drop in the 10 and get on the ball and then go. and. Yeah. B, Rashford adds more balance to it. I agree. I think the thing is as well, Sterling's rapid, but he, he runs with the ball. Yeah. He runs with the ball. And I think the other thing is as well is, like, Kane is becoming such a provider. And this, this is that, that's if right, Kane's going to drop right. into that, if Kane's going to drop into that hole and he's going to turn, like he does with Spurs, and he's got Son, Lucas, or Son and Bow. In the runners, yeah. He's... He's got Jack, he's got Grealish and he's got Sterling and I don't see where that's going to go because yeah, he's going to want to come in. He's going to want to come in. Okay, maybe Gareth is going to be like Sterling getting behind in behind, but you can't just flip a switch like that. 
no, just no, can't no. do it. So whereas Rashford, no, great, it's, it's always going to be there. No, and it's it's a practical it's a practical answer to to that problem. It's ma- it is it's massive. See, Which I remember what, the yeah, game when we played Spain. Brilliant players in the same team. I don't know, but we played Spain. When we played Spain in that UEFA Nations a couple of years back away, we beat them like five two or something like that. We were immense, and we played counter attack, and we played Kane in the nine, and Sterling and Rashford either side. And we. I think immense. that's what Carrick will play. I think that's what he'll play. By the way, as well. By the way, I think the, the great thing again is is, is is it's all our preferences. I think the practical mm. thing is is there's every chance he don't play Grealish, Foden, Sterling all in the same team. Like yeah. that, they get it right. That, that like we, I'm sitting here saying it because I don't know. I just don't think I could bring myself to say that Mount Grealish and Foden don't all play. And like you know, and, and Sterling obviously I think falls. Foden, in I think Foden, if he doesn't play, there's something seriously wrong. Now I was like you six months ago. For me, Jack Grealish. I, I swear to God, I was saying that Grealish is in the top five best players in the world. I was telling people, I was like, this guy, Man United, have got to sign him in the summer. We've got to go and get him. But, and then I've got a mate who supports City and he's banged on, banged on about Foden. I've just been like, I hate City. Like, I, don't even want to, I don't even want to think about it. Um, but then I've watched them and I'm just like, oh my God. And I've listened to the way that Pep talks about him. And That's it's, the thing. it's the way Pep talks about him. When he, he, talks, starts- he talks about him like he's talking about Messi with Foden. Yeah. He must be so- serious. That's the bit that gets me when he starts putting him in the same sentence as Messi. You're like, oh my god, what, what's he seeing yeah. as well? What we're all seeing. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. even if you put in the same paragraph as Messi, you've got to be some player. No. But when he's saying it in the same sentence, it's it's a bit of a joke. No, it's yeah. obscene. It is obscene. Um, Could you be sitting there in the summer at Wembley and you've got them players in front of you? What a choice it's got now oh. compared to. Yeah, five years ago. And and I think the great thing is the great thing is is what you what you said just now is that it's about the players for the game. That's the thing. Yeah. Once he's got the squad of players there and you've got all of those players, let's get it right. They're not all gonna play. He's not gonna play those some of them systems that we we talk about. He's gonna he's gonna he's gonna have a practical line up and set up to the way that He's going to want to go about it, but how good is it that if it ain't right for Foden that you got Grealish, or if you ain't got Rashford, you can bring him on. If you got Calvert Lewin, if you want to put crosses in the box, like whatever it might be, you know it's. And it goes back to what, we, what Brett was saying earlier about when he can't break a team down. Imagine you can't break a team down. You look round, you've got Foden and Grealish sitting behind you. Unbelievable. They're going to be able to go break someone down. Yeah, and, and I think the right back's the perfect scenario for what you said about who you're playing against. The thing is, though, the one thing I'll say about the right-back situation, he ain't, he ain't even going to take wan No. And wan is now going to choose uh, Congo, isn't he? Which I just... And, but that is incredible as to where we've come in, 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 in the recent years. He's like... That when got... it comes to right-backs, I, I wouldn't be picking Walker and I haven't seen enough of Trippier at Madrid to, to comment really on, on Trippier, so I'll leave that one. Cool. But the fact of the matter is, Dale, like if you went and played for Atletico Madrid, you'd be a good defender. So, like Trippier for me is yeah, like Trippier, he's always going to look great in an Atletico Madrid side who let you have the ball and are defending for 95% of the time. And with a goalkeeper, who, I read a stat the other day that he's kept more clean sheets since he's been at Atletico Madrid than he's conceded goals, and he's been there for like seven years. How is that even possible? Can you imagine that. So, you know, if Kieran Tripp, if you're a defender and you're turned up and you're told you have just got to defend mm. and you're a standard of Kieran Trippier, I think the reason why, I wouldn't say it didn't work out at Spurs because he was there for a long time, but the reason, his biggest problem was he was asked to do a lot, wasn't he? He was yeah. asked to go forward, he was asked to come back. Simeone just says, be right back, get set pieces. He's obviously good at crossing, put the ball in the box. Yeah. There's no space in behind. There's no space in behind when you play against Atletico Madrid. He's only going to leave. So wingers, if he's playing against a bit of pace, he don't leave any space there anyway. So he's never going to struggle on them side of things. I think it's he shouldn't be anywhere near the England squad, in my opinion. If, not because he's gone Atletico Madrid, because he's probably become a ten times better defender since being there than what he would have been um, under Poch at, um, at Spurs. But yeah. 
if you're going, all right, well, I'm going to pick Aaron Wan-Bissaka or Trippier. But when Aaron Wan-Bissaka plays in an attacking team in Man United, and all right, I've got to be honest, going forward, he's horrific. Absolutely <laughs> horrific. But defensively, there ain't no one better than him. No one better yeah. than him. One-on-one -on -one situations, no. you ain't getting past him. He's, he's unbelievable. So you're going to have to pick one. One's playing in the Premier League every week in an attacking side. One's playing in La Liga in a side who are really, really defensive. You're going to pick Aaron, surely. Yeah. I, don't, I, I would still have to pick Some of the others he's got there as well. That's the, that's the mad thing, isn't it? I always that's forget it. about Rhys James. Always. Yeah. Always forget about him. It's a shame because the left, but the left side, I'm not a big fan of Chilwell. I'm not. I, he's not. He's not athletic enough for me. He's not. Although he's got good technique and he puts a good ball in, and he's a, he's he's a good defender. I just don't think he's. I, I look at Luke Shaw, and he's got that pace and that drive. Right side, you've got Trent, who's got that pace and that drive, plus a good delivery. It's just Trent can't. For me, Trent is an, a bad, bad defender. Um, I think this year he's had. I think he's had a bad year this year, and I'm not just saying that because he plays for Liverpool. Um, <laughs> but I would pick Wan Bissaka and Walker over Trent on the basis that we're playing France. First game, I think we've got Czech Republic on the tenth. Should have loads of the ball. Might need Trent to um, get up the pitch. No problem with him playing there. You, you'd like to think that Stones and Maguire are going to be able to look after themselves, but. If we're playing France. The other thing, you know, the other thing, like again, you can talk about it all day in terms of the different the different ideas. But I think when you look at um, relationships, like now, the, the, obviously the the environment that the England team performing is a lot different to what it was in the you know in the Capello times, and you know there was a lot of unwarrant wanted pressure around the England team back then. But I think what you get now is that if you look at the likes of Carl Walker, for example, playing next to John Stones. Them things are big. Them yeah. things are big. big yeah. things. To, have, to have lads who are from the same club, the same team, same environment. Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of the England lads now, the whole age group thing has been managed so much better in terms mm -hmm. of those, those you know, lads like Mount and Foden and that have been playing with each other for, for, for a long, long time now. Do you know what I mean? Since they were 15, 16. So it's a bit different, but... I just think it, it is important when you have those those relationships of a Maguire playing in front of a Henderson, do you know what I mean? Or a you know, or a Rashford playing in front of, of Luke Shaw. Well, I think To be fair, of... four four of my five defensively come from Man United. Now mm. that might sound that might sound very biased. And I don't particularly, I don't actually particularly, I don't particularly think Man United are an amazing defensive team uh, defensively. Although we do have quite a decent record, I do with Hen Henderson. I would still pick the higher over Henderson, um, yeah. but I think that's more with my heart than my head. Um, but I think, I think the thing is as well is that like like so I I ain't seen him I ain't seen him play bundles I just like what the kids about do you know what I mean Yeah he's a, he's a, he's a pro, he, for me he's a future United captain like he's yeah. he's born and bred he's he's a warrior like you you can hear, especially now because obviously you can't hear the crowd if you listen to the game all you hear is Henderson all you hear him he's he's and he makes a mistake and it don't look like he gets to him he's like it's gone he's made a couple yeah, of mistakes yeah. for us now and it's like. He bounces that, straight that back. Person, that, that personality to do that playing for Man yeah. United is he's, he's top. If you, I think that we've got a, the club have got a decision to make really because he can't really go out alone. Huh? Do you cash in on the higher and give him what he wants? Do you know what I mean? It's, it is a catch twenty two because you ain't gonna be able to keep them both for a long period of time. No. Someone will come in for for Henderson. If you keep the higher there, yeah, they're both they're both top goalkeepers, so you, it's very very difficult. There's not many clubs that have got two at that level, is there? Exactly that. Exactly Thing is, that. mate, we actually had three because we froze Romero out. Romero was brilliant. Completely got froze out. He's still there now. He done nothing wrong to not be our to not to be our number two. I was. No, you just. Oh, way, unbelievable. Oh, talking about Man United goalkeeper. Yeah, because yeah, no, I'm quite enjoying this conversation. <laughs> It's a call there on that because if not, we're talking for hours and hours. So uh, the last thing we do, Ross, in, in all of these, is, is offer that like, if you wanted to ask us anything, 
Um, so he's there again. If you wanted to, to ask us anything about what, what we do or how we work, then yeah, massively. I think there's there's loads that I could talk to you about because I think, for, like I said earlier, it's about where you are and what you're doing at the time. Do you know what I mean? And I think that for anybody, there's there's things that we all going to pick up and learn from each other. Do you know what I mean? Because because of what you're doing and how much you love football, just from the conversation about England. Now, I suppose from my perspective is that where you both sort of semi-touched on it earlier, but we never really got right into it, is, is what do you do when you train? Do you know what I mean? So, like, I know you say that, like, for argument's sake, you ain't got a game on a Tuesday night and you have a training session. I think that so many people I talk to in certain non-league clubs or whatever, and they go at me, you know, I give the boys a Thursday off, and I think, wow, really? Yeah. You don't train. So what... What is it you then ask of them? And it, but then on a Saturday, you can't then go in the changing room and start screaming and shouting at everyone, telling them you ain't done this and ain't done that because you had an opportunity to go and work on something. I, I think that's the big thing for me is how do you, how or what do you do to prepare your teams? I don't mean specifically because that'd be depending on who you're playing, but you know, what does training look like? You know, I think that, I think that thing, them things like that are important. Yeah, so for us, so if we had the, the two sessions to choose in the Thursday, uh, the Tuesday we'd, we'd get a bit of a graft into them because for, for me, I can't fully trust that they're doing that on their own yeah. outside of the time we've got with them. So we do, we do put a bit of a graft into them knowing that they've got a decent enough recovery before the game. Brilliant. Um, and then from that, we would, we would then go into some, uh, to, and, and one big thing that I've picked up the last, the last year or so is the generic passing drill we've sort of scrapped to a degree because if you can't pass five yards and move off, you shouldn't be playing this level of football. So we go more specific on shape. Uh, and one thing we, we don't do enough of is set pieces that we're looking to address this year because we, we don't do enough of it. And it's a huge part of our level of the game is set pieces. You can you can win games just on, on, on set pieces. So our, our generic week could be over, I'd say, if we're doing two hours on a Tuesday, two hours on a Thursday, about an hour on a bit of a fitness stuff towards the start, and then we go into a bit of uh, of shape and decision making when they're fatigued for the last bit, trying to make sure that they still make the right decisions when they're tired, and then on the the Thursday would be very specific to what we wanted to do the Saturday, whether we was looking to go and press, and then we just drill it into them those type they those types of things and uh, and that front so. And it, a big thing also comes down to what facility you've got and how much yeah, of a pitch you've got. So we, we had a spell this year where we had the quarter of a pitch for half hour, then half of a pitch for half hour, then the full pitch for, for half hour. So we had to really scale the session up and and work to those sort of variables. So that's sort of what, what we do on a, on a general basis. I don't know about you, Brett. We, we're quite unique, really, because I don't know if you know this, Russ, but we we are a very, very, very small club. Um, we started out, as like I said, the grassroots. We had no sort of ambition to go senior football and we've come quite a long way in a short space of time. So we don't have, we don't have a ground. So we ground share. We, uh, we ground share with Great Wakering. So every year we obviously pay our rent and things like that. So training-wise is very difficult. Very difficult. So us and our reserves share half a pitch every Tuesday night for an hour. That's all we get. Um, what we've introduced is on a Thursday, we might get a 3G somewhere if I feel like we needed it or we're slacking somewhere. like Or especially at the start of the season where we... So pre-season for me is the most important time of the season for us in terms of of course, for preparation, but all our foundations are done in pre-season. So where it's light out and stuff like that, we'll go on a pit. We've got we've got grass pitches that we use locally, which is nowhere near the club. Like they're all obviously in South End, but most of the boys are from like Bitteriki and Basildon. So we'll go somewhere, Gloucester Park, where there's a pitch. It won't be great, and all our work will be done there. I'll have them over in two or three, even three times a week: Tuesday night, um, Thursday night, Saturday mornings, and one night will be dedicated to the fitness coach and it'll be difficult. And for the rest of it, and we normally have a long pre-season, we, we'll probably do six weeks. So a lot of teams only do four away. We'll do six weeks. We'll go back early all the time just because 
I've got to make it count pre-season. So if I I try and introduce something every year. So like I said, when I first started, I wanted us to be a possession side. So we introduced straight away. We'd work for six weeks and playing out from the back. And that's it would be repetition all the time, all the time. The following year, we might have introduced pressing. But we'll just probably have one specific thing each year. Um, so that's what we do pre-season. And then really, what we do during the season is we're just topping up, quite frankly, and making the best of a bad situation. Very rarely do I have... Unless it's an FA Cup game or an FA Vars game, and it, I've gone and watched the team before, and I feel that we need to do something specific to that team, will I do a session where it's different, if you like, or in preparation for the Saturday? What I normally do, nine times out of ten, and it will sound sound slightly arrogant to an extent, in our league, where we're one of the better sides, I normally let the other sides worry about us, and I just concentrate on us on a Tuesday night. I know the chances our teams have come and watched us on a Saturday and their Tuesday night might be about us. Whereas I'm sort of like, well, this is the way we play every single week. So it's it's about them coming to us. If I played Darren in the FA Cup, I'd be completely changing things. I would be made, I'd make sure we've got a session on the Tuesday or a session on the Thursday, um, completely based on, on Holbridge. The level where we're at, at the moment is, I feel that I just concentrate on us more than anything. And if that's a case of, I felt on the Saturday we're not as fit as normal. Normal, then I'd have the fitness fitness guy in on the Tuesday night, and I'd work them, and it would be like that. If on the Tuesday night I felt that <coughs> our pass, oh, sorry, on the Saturday I felt that our possession was poor, or our counter attacks were poor, or our crossing was poor, I would literally fixate that whole hour to what was poor on the Saturday rather than looking yeah, forward to the Saturday coming. It, it it's diff- It really is difficult, especially for someone like me because. I feel it's very reactive instead of proactive. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, I would love to. I would love to be able to say, right, Tuesday, you know, Saturday we're playing against Holbridge Sports. Therefore, on Thursday we're going to do an hour, just based on that game. And on the Tuesday, maybe we could do a bit of fitness. We're just not in a position to do that. We're just not in a position to do that. I could not tell you. And Daryl, at the moment, I'm acting secretary at um, Enzyme. Like just, I've only been in. I've been in the job for about five days, but I've already had to book a pitch for a friendly for next for next month. This cup competition, it's crazy at our level of football. The difference what it is because it's our club. We've got a chairman. He's ninety years old. Ninety doesn't send emails and things like that. If he if he wants to send something out, he'll hand write letters out to the boys. It's very very surreal. Um, yeah. But it, we do, like I said at the start, we just make the best of a bad, not a bad situation because oh, no, the, best the, of boys, this the boys absolutely love it. And you said it earlier, it, it, some of the boys, they're playing at this level and they could easily play at Darren's level, but they can't quite do that because of whatever it is. They, don't, they can't train on a Tuesday and a Thursday. Mm. But I, I might give them a bit of leeway in terms of, look, I can't. I can't be there Tuesday night because of whatever reason. I, I, I might say, OK, no problems. It won't affect me selecting them on a Saturday I've, or if they've got a knock, blah, blah, blah. I'd love to be in a position where I've got the physio turned up on a Tuesday to see the injured players and God knows what else. But we don't have a physio. No, and that, and thought, that comes, doesn't it? That comes over time. And exactly. And to be fair, Ross, like since I've been at the club, from where it was... So, you know, we did. I oh, know we still don't have a ground, but when I first took over, there was there wasn't even any players. Like the mm. first team, had, the first team manager actually went over to Basden United and just took the whole team. There was no ambition whatsoever. They come in and said, "Look, we're in the Olympia League Prem. Basically, do you do your best. Like you're not going to get sacked. Just do do what you can. As long as you the fines are paid and things like that, we're quite happy." And then over the last four years, we really have really have pushed on. Like, so, like I said, we're playing the FA Cup now. It, it's mad. It's mad. But Brilliant. I would love to be in a situation where training is much better. That's why I love pre-season. I love pre-season. Like, I sent out the schedule to the boys to, to, uh, to, today because we've been entered in like a pre-season tournament starting next month. And I'm, absolute, I'm more buzzing for pre-season than I am the normal season. When I was a player... I think we all love that. It's the best, isn't it? You walk around, the sun's out. Yeah, no, I'll just... You've got your shorts on and there's no, and there's no pressure. <laughs> it's, the, it's the time as well. For me, it's the, it's just the time. Right. Like, 
But do you know what though? Do you know what's massive? And by the way, like it's 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 fantastic because without without you putting a commitment in, those clubs don't run. Do you know what I mean? And I no, think it's, that's, it's true. That's fantastic. And, and they're they they they're your proudest moments. You know, I, I, I years ago when I worked at, at the Leighton Orient in the, in the football in the community, we started our own club. So I know exactly what it's like to be the the secretary and do all the thing and not have any yeah. time and you know and. And have to, sometimes have to pay the fines yourself. Do you know what I mean? Them sort of yeah, things. Yeah, you know, even like with sponsorship. Yeah, got going, but, but what a great thing to be able to look back on. I think, and I, but I think it is. It's about getting the the. It's about getting the most out of the situation, and it? it's about managing the situation in the best way you can. And I think the one thing that what COVID's done to professional football is hopefully a lot of people that haven't experienced what what yous have gone through or haven't worked in grassroots football or haven't managed kids football teams like I have. So I, so I can look back on them things. And when I've done the job that I did, like you can enjoy the fact that you got every day with the players or whatever, but what COVID has done is it made it new circumstances for everyone. Yeah. You know what I mean, so you're playing twice a week, everyone twice a week for most of the season. So therefore your recovery time, your, planning time, your preparation time becomes restricted. You've got to think on your feet and try to think outside the box sometimes. You know, when do you give players a day off, an extra day off, a bit of rest? When do yeah. you work? When do you not work? When do you have you know, a lot of players inside for recovery? When do you get them out training? It's, it's things that all people have got to be open-minded with, and I think it'll make people better at their jobs, but it's um, it's just interesting to, to see how we all adapt to the different situations and make sure that you're prepared for when the next one comes, whether that's for the good or the bad, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. we're all going to find ourselves in them situations. Yeah, that's the thing, I'm laughing, there's no right or wrong answer to it either. No, of course Everyone, not. Literally, everyone's got their way of doing it and so on. So the the, the final bit that we just want to, I want to ask you, Ross, is what's next? What's next <laughs> for you? What's the, what's the plan? Yeah. Is it time off? Little bit like a uh, little bit like the first one of the first questions you asked really. I think I think bit of bit of like a bit of a breather. I think already um although like I have an odd day here and there where I've been waking up and thinking, Oh god, like not that I'm not going to work at Leighton Orient anymore, but more just oh my god, like like, like realising how restricted everybody's been. I've been really lucky that I've been able to get up and go to work every day, doing something that I love. But being able to get up and go out every day and in, 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 into that environment, and then all of a sudden I ain't. So I think that's really frustrating. But at the same time, I do realise how knackered I was with it all, how draining it had all been. Not just like the back end of it when you lose your job, but like how, how tiring the whole experience has been, how emotional it's all been. So I think I definitely need a little bit of time to breathe. And I think... I don't know if this is going to sound right or wrong, but I think because of what I've done, like in terms of my career, of working with with kids, working with under 18s, you know, working in different environments, recruitment, um, not having jobs in football, I, I feel like I can be prepared for whatever else comes next. And as long as I've got football in my life somewhere along the line, I'll be happy. Do you know what I mean? I think, I know it sounds mental, but I'm really looking forward to. I've got my own little sort of soccer school, if you like. It's not very big, but we've got my own little soccer school that runs on a Saturday morning. I can't wait for that to start once lockdown's over. My little boy plays under nines. Like I'll go and coach them. I'll do a few one to ones, and then just wait and see what feels right. I think I said right at the beginning. I would love some time to have another go at it. But if someone told me it was going to be in ten years. I know I'll be better with whatever I do between now and in 10 years' time. Um, but if someone else said to me, I, you'd never do it again, but you're going to go into 23s football or under-18s football, I think I would I would be happy and comfortable in them positions because it's things I've done before and it's, yeah. it's coaching. And I think I'd be a better under-18s or 23s coach now than when I did it at Bournemouth. Do you know what I mean? So... Because of what I've been through, I think I'll be better at whatever I go and do next. It's just I'm not sure what that is yet and when. Oh, that's perfect, mate. And, and I just want to say thanks, mate. Thanks for, yeah. for your honesty. Big thank is... you, Ross. Big thank no, you, mate. No and um, the chaps, I will I'll say it online, offline, whether you, want it, whether you want it in there or not. But 
you know, if is there ever anything you want to throw at me or whatever, do you know what I mean? Let me know if there's, you know, I'll come and do a session, do you know what I mean? Anything like that, let, let me know. I'll be more than happy to, like I say, to help or, or, uh, I'll give you a little oh, okay. it, might, it might not work, but I'll help you. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, mate. And um and, and good luck in whatever you do do next. Good luck yeah, with massive, it. Good luck, massive good luck. That. And uh thank you very much, mate. Top man. Just want to say a huge thank you to our sponsors, Regal Exchange. These guys are the number one choice for buying and selling any of your luxury items. They're constantly looking out for the best assets out there. So if you're wanting to sell or buy, get in contact with these guys now with all their social media links here.